If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 51. Truth Part 2. Disclaimer. Harry Potter and all of its characters belong to J.K. Rowling. I own nothing but the original characters I make. Dialogue. Thoughts. Dollar Parcel Tongue Dollar. Chapter 51. Truth Part 2. Harry. Lily came running to them as soon as they went into the living room. She gave her son a long hug before checking him for injuries. He is fine, Lily. A healer has already performed a checkup on him. James measured her. Her eyes moved to land on her husband and she did not look happy at all. What took you so much time? It's been hours since we received the message. I had to sit here and wait here for so long, Dot. I'm sorry, things got a bit complicated. James looked at Harry for a second. We have some things to tell you. You have a lot to tell me. I only know that someone attacked our son and Daphne at school. Lily had finally let Harry go of her embrace and they all went to sit down. Before we start. Jamie closed the door and placed an anti-eavesdropping charm. Then, he approached the fireplace and temporarily disabled the floor network. This startled Lily. What is this about, James? Why are you taking so many precautions for? What we are going to tell you, must not come out of here. Not even to our daughters at least for now. James turned to look at Harry and this one nodded. Harry. Lily stared at his son in confusion. This is more than just about the attack, right? Yes, this is going to sound crazy. Harry started. It was already two past midnight when Harry and James were done with the explanations. Lily sat there in silence moving her eyes from James to Harry. There are some details that make little sense, to begin with, time travel doesn't work like that. And second, if you are the future version of our son, why are your personalities so different? I don't want to badmouth my own son, but my Harry was not a good person, I knew this deep inside me. But never dared say it out loud. And I don't think time would have changed him soon much. Harry looked down and let out a sigh. Lily? What are you saying? He made a magical oath in front of me. I tell you, that cannot be faked. I understand your doubts, but he is our son. James insisted. He did not want his wife to make the same mistake he did. I'm not saying he is not our son, but there is more to this story, isn't it, Harry? Lily's intense glare was starting to make him uncomfortable. When you woke up at the hospital, you looked at me like you had just seen a ghost. You failed to remember many details of your life so the healer concluded you had amnesia. But there was one answer that struck me as odd. Odd. Asked James. You weren't there yet. Lily glanced at James. The healer asked Harry about his date of birth. And Harry answered. July 31, 1980. With complete conviction. He got the date wrong. Why is that so important? James didn't understand it. But Harry did. He could already imagine what conclusion his mother had arrived at. People would often tell me that you were the smartest witch of your generation when I asked about you. They were right. Harry smiled. Harry? What are you James was interrupted by Lily. An alternate timeline. Asked Lily. Harry nodded. How is it possible, isn't time supposed to be linear? James exclaimed. Research about time travel has been forbidden by the ministry for the last two centuries. Time turners have been limited to a few hours to avoid any big change. We don't really have a way to know but there have been theories about alternate timelines. And if he came from a different one, where? Lily opened her eyes widely as she realized something. What is it, Lily? James looked at her with concern. Lily looked at Harry. Were you really born on July 31? I was, yes. Admitted Harry. So really are you from a different timeline, Dot? Asked James. One where you were born on a different day. But I don't see that changing much, to be honest. This changes a lot. Think about it, James. Lily raised her voice. Have you forgotten about what Dumbledore said back then, born as the seventh month dies? James' eyes opened like plates. That's impossible. But then. The old man told you about the prophecy then. Said Harry. James and Lily turned to look at him with surprise. You know about it too? Albus only told us part of it. The same part that Voldemort learned about. He wanted us to know why he was so obsessed with the Longbottoms. Said James. Harry, were you? 
Lily seemed hesitant to ask what she wanted to ask. That's right. Harry glanced at his mother. I was born as the seventh month died and my parents had defied him three times. The bastard chose me to mark as his equal. That Halloween night in 1981, he came to my house and made me an orphan before falling victim of his own curse. He died, albeit temporarily and Dumbledore declared me as the boy who lived before dumping me on the doorsteps of the Disleys. Harry said with a hint of bitterness in his voice. Despite the many years that have passed, he still has a hard time forgiving the old man for that one. You said that we died early in the war, I didn't think it was this early. No wonder you didn't remember Lyra and Holly. They were never born in your time. Said James. He left you with Petunia and Vernon. Cried Lily. But they hate magic, what was he thinking? Lily dear, calm down. You are going to wake up the girls. James tried to placate his wife. Lily went to hug her son. Oh, Harry, I'm sorry, you just had a tough life. Well, it wasn't ideal. But it wasn't all bad. I later on got to meet Uncle Lupin, and I also had Sirius, for a few years at least. Sirius was alive. James perked up at hearing that name. Harry, we want to hear everything about your life, but now is getting very late. Let us all go to sleep and we will talk more tomorrow. We have a few days before you need to come back to school, right? Asked Lily to her husband. That's right. Said James. We have time, we are not going anywhere. Harry wasn't sure if they realized the implication of what he had revealed to them. If the one occupying the body of their son was a different version from a different timeline, then what happened to their son? At least to the version they knew, the one they raised since he was a baby. Whatever the case, they didn't ask him. Maybe they knew he didn't have the answer or maybe they preferred to ignore it. Chapter 52, Dungarian Fever He spent a total of three days at home. There was a lot they had to talk about but with so little time, they decided to postpone any serious talk to the summer vacations. James seemed to be extremely busy with work and only came home late at night. Lily did her best to pretend that nothing had changed after his revelation and continued to treat him the same way. Harry could tell what she was doing but did not point it out. Holly was thrilled to have him home for a few days and Lyra didn't seem to care much. She received some basic explanation about the events at Hogwarts and didn't ask any further. The lack of reaction his sister had after finding out about the attempt against his life was somewhat concerning. But something he didn't have time to worry about right now. His return to school didn't call for much attention. He was just a first year and most of the school didn't even know he existed. Even in his own year, he only talked with a few students. You are back. Hermione greeted him with a smile after he entered the common room. She seemed to be the only one who had noticed him. Are you feeling better from the, Dungarian fever, was it? She asked, looking a bit unsure. By Merlin's pants, what is a Dungarian fever, is that the excuse Dumbledore promised to make, dot. Harry wondered. I'm fine now, thanks. He hoped that she would not ask any questions about this disease that he hoped at least existed. In case she goes for some research at the library, if she hasn't done so already. I'm glad to hear that. She felt relieved. Did I miss anything interesting? He asked. Yes actually. Just the day after you left, the headmaster informed us that Professor Nayer had to go back to India for some urgent matters that could not wait until the end of the school year. Hermione explained. Oh, that's too bad. He was a good professor. It wasn't a complete lie. Nayer had been a good professor for the most part. If you don't count the whole trying to murder students business. Hermione nodded in agreement. Yes, I like the way he explained things, but do you know who is replacing him for the rest of the year? She asked with excitement in her voice. The headmaster. He said. Hermione looked at him with surprise. Yes. How did you know? Because the same thing happened after Quirrell was reduced to ashes. Educated guess. Hi, Harry. Harry and Hermione turned their heads to see Neville, Ron, and Seamus descending the stairs of the bedrooms. Hello, guys. Harry greeted the trio. Where were you, I thought you quit school or something. Commented Ron. He was sick, remember? Professor McGonagall said something about some fever or something. Added Seamus. Dungarian fever. Neville corrected. I have an aunt who had that a few years ago. Nasty thing. She spent several days in the bathroom. Okay, I don't want to know. Thought Harry. 
everything went back to normal business after that. He had expected Dumbledore to call for him for one of his private meetings at his office that he had grown accustomed during the years. He knew the old man had some doubts about his story but Harry was unsure of what kind of conclusions he could be making. The fact that he didn't call for him could mean that his worries were not severe or the headmaster was worried about his father's reaction if he called Harry to his office in order to read his mind. After all, this version of Harry was not an orphan that no one cared about. He was the son of a head aura and one that Dumbledore was hoping to bring to his side again. After the inquisitive look he received from Daphne on the first day of his return, he was waiting for a note to land on his table at any moment. But to her credit, the girl managed to hold on until Friday. As usual, he snuck around using his invisibility cloak and found her sitting on a bench, close to their usual meeting room. She gave a cry of surprise when he threw the cloak over her, revealing himself. Her expression moved swiftly from shock to anger and she hit him on his chest with her tiny fists. Don't do that again, Potter. Did you notice that you only call me Potter when you are angry? This question earned another punch to the chest. Deciding to keep his mouth shut, he guided her to the room. We shouldn't take too long. I'm sure the headmaster is trying to keep an eye on me. During the entire week, the people inside the paintings have shown a lot of interest in him. Following him around wherever he went. That's why he had been avoiding going to either, the Room of Requirements or the Castle Foundation. Are you going to tell me what really happened to the professor? Daphne went right to the point. I know he didn't just run away. Can't tell you that. He answered. Do I not have your trust? My family made a magical binding contract with yours. Betraying you would have very serious consequences, as you already know. She raised her voice with an unusual display of emotion. Calm down, I'm not trying to insult you or your family's integrity, how good are your occlumency shields? Harry asked. Daphne raised an eyebrow. Why? Because if you want me to reveal that kind of information, I must be sure that no one can steal it from you. Are you suggesting that someone may use legilimency on me, here in Hogwarts? Asked the blonde. Harry nodded. Father said that they are good, for my age. Harry took his spare wand from the holster. May I test them? Daphne looked hesitant but eventually nodded. This seems to be the only way to get her answers. Legilimency. She felt like a hammer had smashed her head open and fell backward with a painful cry. What the bloody hell was that, Potter? She shouted. It was a good thing he warded the room with a silencing charm. That was a half-assed attempt to invade your mind. I'm not very skilled with the mind arts so I don't have the subtly that, others have. But I can still say with confidence that your occlumency shields are, trash, for lack of a better word. What? She looked ready to bite him. I guess with her shields broken, the Ice Queen is not that good at keeping her emotions in check Harry concluded. Calm down. I may have an idea. He added. Chapter 53, The Mind Arts Occlumency Lessons Asked Daphne with disbelief. And what makes you qualified to teach me? I destroyed your shields with no effort. Someone more skilled than me could get into your mind, get whatever information they want, and leave before you even noticed it. Daphne looked worried now. Is that possible? She then looked at Harry. But you said you are not very good at the mind arts. Can you really teach me? Harry shrugged. I'm better at occlumency than legilimency, that's for sure. I would not claim to be one of the best at it. But I can definitely help you improve. And, if I better my mental defenses, are you going to answer all of my questions? No. Harry answered simply. What, why not? She asked with a demeanor that showed her young age. Don't pout, if you become able enough to defend your mind. I will tell you some things. She looked offended. I don't pout, can Tracy come with? Sure, why not? He would like to bring Neville too, but separating him from Ron and Seamus might be impossible at this point. Well, since you won't tell me anything else, I will take my leave. She stood from the couch and made her way to the fireplace, where the secret passage was located. Don't worry, I can open it myself. She tapped her wand on the stone and the passage opened. Oh, wait, Daphne. Harry had just recalled something important. The warning came a bit too late, as she had already climbed into the opening. What is it, uh, there is something blocking the tunnel, what is this? Asked Daphne. Oh, crap. Harry prepared himself. Ah Merlin, what is this smell? I can't see anything, 
Lumos, Ahahaha. Uh, uh, uh. Harry heard the girl let out a tremendous shriek before she passed out from the shock. Right, I should get rid of that corpse. He hasn't had the time to remove the decomposing body of Professor Nayer. The shrinking charm he used to hide it was only meant to last a couple of days. He removed the unconscious Daphne from the hole and placed her gently onto one of the sofas. He then pulled out his spare wand. Sorry about that, Obliviate. It was the least he could do for the girl. Let's take care of you now, I think the dark forest would be a good choice for this. There are plenty of carnivorous species that will make the body disappear. He grabbed the professor and apparent away. Are you serious, Daphne? You didn't tell me the study group was going to have two Gryffindors. Tracy looked at her friend with a deep frown. To be honest, I didn't know about the second one either. Daphne looked at the second Gryffin four in question. Granger, isn't it? Hello. Hermione looked very nervous under the invasive gaze of the two Slytherin girls. Harry decided to help her out. I figured that a study group would look more natural with more people. Hermione is already well known for her interest in academics, so. So you thought that we would be in less trouble if our housemates found out about this, group? Asked Daphne. But she is a muggle-born. Said Tracy, earning a look from the other three. I didn't mean it in a bad way. She was quick to explain. But how would Malfoy and the others react if they knew? We don't owe him any explanations. Daphne frowned. You don't, but there is no need to make things more difficult for you two. We can keep our activities a secret. Suggested Harry. We are not breaking any rules, right? Hermione looked worried. Of course not. This is just another type of defensive magic. Said Daphne. Then why couldn't I find anything about it in the list of magic taught at the school? Asked Hermione. Most children from pure blood families are taught by their parents so is not covered in Hogwarts curriculum. Explained Harry. That's not fair. So Muggleborns never learn to protect their minds. Asked the girl. If they want to learn, they can buy a book about it. As Daphne said, is not illegal to learn it, is just not taught in school. Harry said as they continued to walk through the sixth floor. Here we are. He opened the door of an empty classroom. Professor McGonagall said that we can use any of the empty classrooms on this floor, as long as we leave before dinner time. That's very generous of her. Said Daphne. Well, it was her favorite student the one who made the request. Harry looked at Hermione and this one became embarrassed by the comment. Oh, this classroom is smaller than the ones we use, but is very cozy. Remarked Tracy. The class was indeed small, with only ten seats in it, plus the teacher's table. The three girls went to look for a place to sit down while Harry closed the door. You are not the only one who finds these classrooms cozy, you know. Harry added. What do you mean, wow, those seats are very comfortable. Hermione laid back on her chair. I mean that these isolated classrooms that no one uses are very tempting for older students to visit at night, for their activities. Harry chuckled. He knew this from first-hand experience. He and Ginny had visited several of them during his sixth year. Daphne realized what he meant while she was resting her head against the table. Eo. She jumped off the chair. Gross, what the Tracy looked down at the table with disgust. Oh. Hermione left the chair in a hurry. Can we use a different classroom perhaps? The girl said with a disgusted expression. No. Was Harry's answer. You really think there is any classroom here that hasn't been used? Get over it, I'll just teach you the cleaning charm, you'll be fine. Chapter 54, Intruder Another month passed in peace, and the end of his first year at Hogwarts was coming to an end. The scrutiny that Dumbledore had placed him under, was seemingly done. He had not noticed any more paintings spying on him and ghosts were not following him anymore. Whatever suspicion the headmaster had about Harry's actions was satisfied, or maybe the old man realized he was not going to find what he was looking for. Harry had spent the entire month without his usual trips to the room of requirement. The only thing he was able to train was his occlumency shield, while also helping Hermione, Tracy, and Daphne with theirs. He had considered going straight to the headmaster's office and telling him everything. About himself, his timeline, everything he knew about Voldemort and how that maniac had ruined the entire world. Things would be so much easier if he could count with the support of his old mentor and he did not need to hide his actions from him but he had many worries and doubts that kept stopping him every time the idea popped into his mind. To begin with, he didn't know if, 
deep down, this was the same man he knew. Different events could lead to people with different personalities or beliefs. And even if he was the same person he was familiar with, how would his Dumbledore react to the information he had? There was no way to know for sure. One thing he was certain of, Dumbledore would never agree with his methods and the things he has planned on doing. Harry had long moved away from being his innocent pupil who only resorted to stunners and disarming charms. Those methods had proven ineffective against the Voldemort and Death Eaters he met in the past. The headmaster wanted to make his enemies see the error in their ways and give them a chance to change their minds and be better people. It was a nice thought, but it could only be applied to sane people. Trying to teach reason and morals to a group of immoral madmen should be considered madness in itself. It might be a bit early to cast judgment upon all Death Eaters of this world. But he could judge at least one of them. Lucius Malfoy had already gone too far. Hiring an assassin to kill an innocent child was beyond vile, and Harry was not willing to let that one slide. During this month, he had not heard a single thing about the progress of the investigation involving Professor Nayer. But one thing was assured, Lucius Malfoy has not and will not suffer any consequences for his actions if is left to the law. I'm sure father would also disagree with this too, but there is no other way. Harry continued to sneak around the dungeon corridors until he reached the entrance to the Slytherin dorms. The three boys he had been following since they left the Great Hall were about to open the entrance. Always pure as soon as the words left Draco's lips, the two snake statues moved aside, revealing an entrance. The trio of boys went inside without noticing the invisible intruder following right behind them. Harry observed his surroundings from under his invisibility cloak. The Slytherin common room was a lot darker and gloomier than the Greyfinder Tower. The lack of light could be explained by being below ground and lacking windows that could let moonlight inside. But with the great variety of magical lighting sources, this was unquestionably a design choice. He could spot a few groups inside the room. A young couple were getting busy in one of the corner sofas. Someone was reading a book in front of a fireplace. And a group of three older boys were occupying the couches at the center. Draco entered the room and stared at the couple in the corner, a bit taken aback by their lack of shame. Oh, is Mr. Malfoy already interested in snogging? The one who spoke and the other two boys started to laugh. Shut up, Flint. Draco spat with anger. Despite the age difference, Draco did not have to show any special respect to his seniors in the house. After all, his father was one of the most politically powerful people in the country and he was his only heir. Even the oldest students treat Draco with care. Marcus Flint, the fifth-year Quidditch captain was a tall but skinny boy. He smiled at Draco. Don't be like that, Draco. I was just joking a bit. Yeah, we know you have a fiancé. If you want to try, all you have to do is ask her. One of the other seniors said. Just make sure you don't leave her alone with Derek, that guy likes them very young. Flint gave Draco an honest warning. Draco frowned at the reminder of his engagement. This was something his father decided without his input, not that he had any reason to complain about the agreement, at least not a valid one. I don't care for her, she is just an annoying girl. Ha, give it a couple of years and Parkinson will look less annoying, I can guarantee you that. The last boy, a fourth year called Adrian Pusey spoke. Draco got fed up with the topic of the conversation so they left the common room at a brisk pace with Crabble and Goyle following right behind. The trio passed through a few corridors before stopping at a series of doors. Unlike the rest of the houses, Slytherin students had the privilege of individual bedrooms, so after speaking a brief good night to his two goons, he opened the door of his bedroom and went inside. He, of course, failed to notice that tonight, he had an unwanted guest with him. Chapter 55, Kidnapper Draco threw his bag to one side and paced around the room. Tisk, so stupid. Why should I care for that annoying girl? If father hasn't ordered me to. That's not nice. To talk about your fiancé in such a manner. The voice of Harry had completely startled the boy. Who's there, show yourself. Draco shouted with as much authority as an eleven-year-old could muster. It wasn't strange to Harry that Draco was unable to recognize his voice. The two of them had barely exchanged a few words during the entire year. If this is a prank, I swear. I'm going to tell my father about this. Imperial. Wah. Draco was covered by a mist that entered his nostrils and made his eyes glaze, losing their vitality. Harry removed the cloak, as there was no more need of hiding. He just had to make sure to erase his memories after his business was concluded. I'm going to ask you a few questions, you will answer only with the truth, is that clear? 
Draco looked at him but didn't question Harry's presence in his room and he seemed to be perfectly fine with it. Yes. He answered. Okay, here we go. Would your father normally be at home right now? The boy nodded. Yes, the father usually ends his work at the ministry around four in the afternoon and then goes home. Draco explained. What about your mother? Harry asked next. She is always at home unless my father takes her somewhere. Draken said without showing much change in his expression like he was just talking about something very trivial with an old friend. Poor woman, is there anyone else at your house? Draco shrugged. Just the two house elves. Harry looked satisfied with the answer. He could easily deal with that amount of occupants in the house, especially if it was a surprise attack. Good, now, is your house located on the top of a hill that oversees a small fishing village called Wiltshire? Yes, those filthy muggles are where they belong, beneath us. Draco said with a satisfied smile. So, the house is at the same place I remember. That saves me the trouble of having to delve into the mind of Malfoy. Harry thought, ignoring Draco's racist remarks. Malfoy, look down now. Harry gave a peculiar command to the other boy. Draco obeyed his order without questioning it and moved his head to stare at the floor. Harry examined the top of his head. There was nothing unusual that could be spotted at first glance. But he knew better. This was the place where the tracking mark was applied. From what he knew about this mark, it was not as intrusive as a normal tracking charm. It only kept the general location of the student while inside the castle but its main purpose was to warn the school if a student left the ward's perimeter without permission, which also included the train station in Hogsmeade. Harry had already removed his own. But for Draco, it was better to do something else. Stay like this, Harry commanded. He walked to the boy's desk and picked up a piece of blank parchment he had on it. He used his wand to move the mark to the parchment, the spell was not a complex one. Just something that he was taught by a very talented witch one day. The previously invisible ink was now shown with a dark red color on the parchment. All that was left was to reapply the mark on his head when they came back to this room and no one would even notice he was gone in the first place. All right, Malfoy. Hold on to my arm, we are going for a little trip. Harry held out his spare wand and two of them disappeared from the room with a faint pop. It was dark and the air was very chilly on the north coast of England. He could glimpse the light coming from the windows of the Malfoy Manor ahead of him, but if a muggle was in his place, they would only see darkness, before feeling the urgent need to leave the place. The second part was also meant to affect Harry but his mental protections were already enough to swat away a compulsion of this level. The manor could almost pass as a castle. The construction looked very ancient and even had a high tower that poked from behind the main building. As much as he always disliked every member of this family, he had to admit that it was an impressive place. Don't let go of my arm, Harry ordered Draco. The Slytherin boy did not question any of his commands and just nodded. They passed the first layer of defense and walked to the front door with no issue, but Harry knew that the danger was far from over. Their strongest defenses were here. Draco was going to be his key to enter the manor. Without the boy, Harry would have to deal with some very nasty protections. He knew this from personal experience as it was not the first time he entered this place. Voldemort chose the house as his personal hideout for a good reason. Malfoy, invite me into your house, Harry said. Of course please come into my house. Draco's emotionless delivery made Harry a bit doubtful if this stunt was going to work. He had only heard about this method of bypassing wards from others but never had a chance to test it. As soon as Draco opened the front door and they stepped inside, he could finally breathe a sigh of relief. But he was also filled with dread, this same method could be used to enter his own manner. This was something he would have to work on. But for now, the hardest part was over. All that was left was to find Lucius Malfoy. Who goes there, is that you Draco? The voice of Lady Malfoy came from a nearby room. Chapter 56, Interview with a Death Eater Wait here. Close your eyes and cover your ears. Harry ordered Draco before hiding under his invisibility cloak and walking to the door that was now opening. Narcissa Malfoy was not even able to get past the door frame before she was blasted with a stunner potent enough to send her flying backward until she landed on a nearby couch. The two house elves appeared with a loud pop noise. Ah oh, no, Mrs. Malfoy. The first house elf cried. The other elf did not seem to care that much and just stared at the unmoving woman with a blank stare. A red spark of light aimed at the first elf, impacted on the back of the head and she went down. The other elf stared at Harry with adoration. Mister came here to kill Dobby's family. 
he asked with an expression that was hard to read. Harry was not expecting to answer any questions before knocking out the elves. But this was not just a random elf, but one to whom he owes a great deal. So he decided to try a different approach. No, okay, maybe I'll kill one of them. Dobby started to jump with joy. Yes, the evil master is going to leave, Dobby must celebrate, no. Dobby bad, Dobby must go pushing himself, dot. Wait, I have to. Pop the elf disappeared before Harry could do anything. I guess it's fine to ignore that one. What is all this ruckus? The angry voice of Lucius Malfoy could be heard coming from upstairs. Harry placed a silencing charm on his shoes and hurried up the stairs without making any noise. Why aren't you answering, Narcissa? He reached the door and heard Lucius standing up from his chair and slamming his hands on the desk. Tabby, Dobby, damn it, you are going to be punishing yourselves all night if you don't answer me this instant. Lucius walked at a quick pace to the door. All Harry had to do was wait. Lucius slammed the door open and was met with Harry's wand pointing at his chest. Wah! Depulso! Lucius was pushed back with tremendous force and crashed against his desk, shattering a piece of it before landing on the floor with a few broken ribs. Let's see, your wife and one of your elves cannot answer you because they have been stunned. But you will be glad to know that your other elf is following your wish to punish himself, or maybe he is celebrating, I'm not sure. Lucius groaned in pain and reached for something on top of his desk. He grasped a black cane and brought it down. Lucius then proceeded to use the harmless cane to support himself. With a smooth motion he had rehearsed a million times, Lucius took his wand off the top of the cane and turned around to aim it at Harry. Divulsa. Harry's dark curse, cut Lucius' wand in half before it could be used. Along with two of Lucius' fingers. Lord Malfoy screamed in agony and clutched his injured hand. He then moved his face to look at Harry with an enraged expression. Drop the charade. Reveal your true aspect, who are you? He demanded. Harry just stared at the other man without saying a word. Your face looks familiar, James Potter? Is that you? His face contorted with fury. You damn second-class auror, you dare barge into my house and attack me, I'll have you in Azkaban by tomorrow. And you're with... Crucio. Lucius' sentence was interrupted by his own screams. Harry only held the curse for a few seconds. He needed the man sane enough to talk. Lucius' body trembled like a leaf. And no. Lucius spoke between groans. The James P. Potter I know, would never resort to use, T that. Does it matter who I am? And you would be surprised with how much can people change, after you take away what's important to them. What do you want? Screamed Lucius. Just for you to answer a few simple questions, like, where is Voldemort and what is he up to now? Lucius flinched at the mention of the name. You are looking for the Dark Lord. I don't know anything about that. Yeah, I didn't expect you to talk that easily. That's why I came prepared. Harry took out a small vial with a dark liquid inside. Open up. Verita serum. Lucius recognized the vial. Correct. This is the most reliable method to get the truth. Now open your mouth, two drops will be enough. Lucius continued to stare at him and refused to obey. Want to get the Cruciatus again? Don't make this harder on yourself than it needs to be. The Death Eater finally complied and opened his mouth. Harry then proceeded to empty the entire vial down his throat. Lucius started to cough violently. Two drops was enough. You bastard. That was for wasting my time, Harry said nonchalantly. He waited for Malfoy to recover a bit. Okay, let's do a control question. When is the last time you fucked your wife? Lucius frowned and clenched his teeth, struggling against the potion's effects. But eventually, the compulsion to answer won. Three years. Wow, poor woman indeed. Harry lamented. Is it because you are attached to men? No. Screamed Lucius. Harry looked at the empty vial with suspicion. Is this really working? He stole it from Snape's personal cabinet so it should be genuine. I'm going to kill you for this. Spat Lucius. Fine, let's say is working. Let's try again. Where is Voldemort? I don't know. He shouted. Harry was not expecting that. If Malfoy was under some contract that prevented him from revealing that information he should have remained silent. Even the Verita serum is not powerful enough to overwrite something like a blood oath. You really don't know, how is that possible? When was the last time you saw him? 
Lucius had to think for a moment. 31, October, 1981 Chapter 57, Interview with a Death Eater Part 2 That is the day he, he attacked the Longbottom family. He almost said the wrong name. What happened that day? That day, we had a very long meeting to iron down the details for the attacks that were to take place that same night on several members of the vigilante group created by Dumbledore. The Dark Lord had a, special interest in the Longbottoms so he decided to go alone, very much against our recommendation. What did you do then? My mission was to go with Dalahove and kill the Pruitts, damn blood traitors. Molly Weasley family. Harry recalled. Did you succeed? Harry asked. For the most part. Only a few of the women survived, for what I know. Lucius answered without noticing Harry's cold expression. What happened next? After our mission was completed, we went back to our hideout and waited for the remaining members to come back. By the end of the night, all of them were back except for the Dark Lord himself. Continue, Harry commanded. Bellatrix and the Lestrange brothers went to look for him at the Longbottom Manor, but like our Lord, they never come back. We found out later, by the account of two surviving witnesses, Augusta Longbottom and a house elf, that the Dark Lord had been gravely injured during the attack and had fled the place. What about the Lestrange? Did they find anything? They disappeared after that night, we never saw them or received any message from them again. We don't know what happened to them. But he is still alive, Harry said. It was more a statement than a question. Lucius struggled against the compulsion. Crucio. Lord Malfoy let out a blood-curdling scream. Don't waste more of my time Malfoy, your wife and son are downstairs. Don't think for a moment that I will not use them to get what I want. Draco is here. Lucius was startled. Answer me, is he alive? I know about the mark. You. Lucius wanted to be the one to ask questions now but he knew better at this point. Yes, he is alive. He said in defeat. The mark weakened after the incident but it never went away, and now is getting stronger. Did he leave with you a black diary? Or any other object he considered important, to watch over it? Malfoy looked very surprised at my question. How do you k? Just answer. I, he left me a book like that, yes, but it's gone now. It vanished one day. Vanish. Harry considered this for a moment. Voldemort may have a way of recalling his horrocruxes back to where he is. That would explain why he couldn't find Ravenclaw's diadem at Hogwarts. And he never tried to contact any of you or use the mark to call upon you. Never. This makes little sense. Why would he disappear with only the Lestrange and never call upon his followers, were his injuries that bad, but there is something else that is bothering me. He looked at Lucius. You are hiding something else, if Voldemort disappeared without a trace, ten years ago and never contacted you again, why are the Death Eaters still launching random attacks? There may be few and far between but Harry had found records of dozens of attacks performed by Death Eaters in the last decade. At first, he thought Voldemort was just trying to make sure no one forgets about him while he prepares for his return. But if he has not been the one in charge, who is? We have a different leader now. Said Lucius. Everyone just agreed to follow someone different? You better tell me everything Malfoy. The idea was suggested around a month after the Dark Lord's disappearance, the members of the Outer Circle were starting to get anxious by the lack of news from our leader. Some started to suggest that he may have abandoned us or even died, we were having a meeting at my house when someone came up with the idea of having one of us impersonating the Dark Lord in order to calm everyone. After all, only the members of the Inner Circle knew what the Dark Lord looked like. I don't think Voldemort would have appreciated that. Harry commented. So, who took the mantle of the new Dark Lord? Lord Parkinson. Parkinson, MMM. He didn't recall much about that man from his past life. Which can only mean he was very unremarkable. Okay, continue. It was only meant to be temporary, a few months, maybe a year, until our Dark Lord returned. But he never returned and Lord Parkinson's influence became stronger as time passed. He gained the favor of most Inner Circle members and then he started to show himself in front of the Outer Circle members during our big reunions. He wanted everyone in the organization to recognize him as the one and only Dark Lord. Harry could easily guess that man's intentions. Lucius nodded. His position has become unshakable now. He is truly a Dark Lord. And what is his goal? Certainly, you are not going to tell me that he expects to take over the county with his magical might. No, 
Lord Parkinson is only decent when it comes to practical magic. But he is a cunning man. We have spent years following his instructions to infiltrate the most influential positions in the ministry as well as gaining seats of the wizard Gamma to our side. In just one or two more years, we could have complete control of the country. A war of politics. Harry said with dread. He had no clue how to fight something like that. And why did your group start to increase the attacks recently? He asked. What do you know about the attempted kidnapping of Lily Potter? He added. Oh, that. That was just a plan to lure out James Potter. The Auror has been sticking his nose in our business too much lately. He has been trying to gather evidence of any illegal dealings. You plan to use his wife to lay a trap for him and kill him. What about her, were you going to kill her too? He tried to sound detached at least. A smile appeared on Malfoy's face. Eventually, after we had our fun. Harry clenched his wand. If that's why you don't touch your wife, you only liken it when they resist, is that it? Malfoy would have probably answered that one even without the Verita serum. Is the one thing those mudbloods are good for. I like to see them squirm beneath me like. Avada Kedavra. While he was reminiscing about his good times, a flash of green light hit Lucius Malfoy on his chest and his lifeless body fell on the polished wooden floor. Enjoy your time in hell, Lord Malfoy. Chapter 58, Seven Arcs Tones Array It's perfect. Harry smiled at the formless metallic and multicolor substance floating in front of him. He had been a bit worried about losing his batch of Magi Sight Alloy since he hadn't been able to check on it for an entire month, but after a thorough inspection, he concluded that everything was in a perfect state. This may be the best one I have ever created. The ambient conditions of this chamber seem to be ideal. He clutched his wand and started to transfigure and reshape the metal. There was no time to waste, once it was out of the cauldron, the magicite alloy would start to cool down and solidify very rapidly, and once it was done cooling, the metal would become nearly indestructible by any means. Harry got to work, he started by dividing the mass of molten metal into seven parts. Four were transformed into rings, two into ear rings and the last one took the shape of a pendant. Now, on to the next step. The seven small arcs tones he had prepared in advance, flew off the table and embedded themselves into the jewelry pieces he had just created while the metal was still soft. The previously multicolor metal was now turning into a dark shade of blue. I need to hurry, dot. There was little time left and he still had to complete the most important step. Engraving the seven runic arrays onto the metal before it completely cools down. Without the runes, these would be nothing more than some pretty pieces of jewelry. And very expensive ones at that. He picked up the runic engraving tools he had previously set on the nearby table and started to carve the runes on the surface of the metal. He had practiced writing this particular set of runes, hundreds of times during this year in preparation for his moment. So now he was able to perform the task with swiftness and precision. Less than two minutes later, he had completed the runic engraving in all seven pieces. As the metal finished its cooling process, its color changed to a beautiful silver with a light blue tint on its surface. Harry placed the seven pieces on the table and carefully examined them one by one, looking for any flaws or mistakes in his work. After all, a single poorly engraved rune could cause a catastrophic failure when trying to use the artifact. Harry smiled in satisfaction after finding no flaws in his work. He then began to place them on. Two rings on each hand, one on the pinky finger and one on the thumb to keep them as separate as possible and avoid contact between two charged arcs tones. For the pendant, he had prepared a resistant piece of magical string that he used to tie it out around his neck. The last two pieces were earrings so he was forced to pierce his ears to secure them in place. He chose to put them at the top part so it was easier to conceal with his messy hair. The placement for each piece of jewelry was not carelessly chosen by him. Years later after its initial invention, the magic storing jewels received several upgrades. Over a decade after the start of the last war, a talented squib boy came up with the idea of combining a set of jewels to create a runic array where each piece will complement and enhance each other. The number seven is a magically important one, and certain numbers have power in them when it comes to magic at least. And thus, the seven arcs tones array artifact came to be. Let's give it a test run. Despite its small size, each of the arcs tones is able to hold the equivalent amount of magic of an adult wizard. By activating one after the next, he could perform seven times the amount of magic that a normal adult wizard would be capable of. However, the true potential of the artifact could only be seen when all seven were activated at the same time. These stones had been absorbing the ambient magic of the chamber for an entire month and were filled to the brim. 
Following Harry's will, all seven became active and started to shine with a strong blue light. Let me see how unbreakable these columns actually are. Professor McGonagall told me that Professor Dumbledore will not be able to teach defense today, Hermione remarked during breakfast. So, we have free time today. Lavender perked up after hearing the news. Sem's rare for the headmaster to leave without much of warning like this. Something serious must have happened. Said Parvati. That's what you always say. And is never something serious. Huffed Lavender. Excuse me, when did I do that? Parvati looked offended. Well, what about last month when Faye's cat went missing and you came up with the idea that the poor kitten was eaten by a necromantula that remained hidden in the castle, Lavender explained. That could have been true. Parvati exclaimed. I told you already, there is no way the professors would have missed something like that. Hermione hated when people talked bad about her professors or suggested they were incompetent at their jobs. The bushy-haired girl turned her head to look at Harry who was currently reading a newspaper at the table. Say Harry, do you know if something important happened? Maybe. He handed her the paper. Read the front page. The girl did just that. Lord Lucius Malfoy, murdered, wait, Malfoy. What? shouted Parvati. Let me see that. Malfoy, like Draco Malfoy from Slytherin. Hermione had only seen him a few times when he came to pick up fights with Neville. That's his father, I just noticed that he is missing from the Slytherin table. Lavender said. This is a huge deal. According to my father, Lord Malfoy was one of the most influential wizards in the country. Parvati said while looking at the paper cover. Harry went on to finish his breakfast not really caring much for their conversation. One down. He told to himself. Chapter 59, Just the Beginning The school year came to an end without any more extracurricular activities. Draco had been a lot quieter after he came back, he also stopped trying to pick fights with Neville, Ron, and Seamus and at least Neville was grateful for that. It was hard to tell how this change was going to affect Draco in the long run, but this was not something Harry was going to worry about at the moment, he had better things to think about than Draco Malfoy. The boy who lived had a bit too much excitement for his first year, and became somewhat paranoid when he was outside the common room. So it was a good thing he never learned about the assassin who had been hired to kill him. As far as the students knew, Professor Nayer had just gone back to his country due to some personal emergency. Daphne didn't try to contact him for more meetings after they were done with their acclumency practices. She did promise to practice hard during the summer and that could only mean that next year, she was going to pressure him some more to satiate her inquisitive mind. In some ways, Daphne reminded him of Hermione. When there is something she wants to know, she never seems to give up. He had no idea of what to expect for next year. With Lord Malfoy dead and the diary gone, things have become truly unpredictable. Was Neville even a parcel mouth? Like the previous him was. Harry wondered. This leads him to another, more important question, was Neville even a horocrux? He does have the cursed scar, but since Voldemort didn't die, would the Horocrux still be created? Could the deaths of his parents have worked as the catalyst this time around? The prophecy still existed in this timeline, he was at least sure of that. If the prophecy was still the same, the events of that Halloween night should have been very similar to the ones he knew, just with a different baby. But the many differences seemed to point towards something else going on. Voldemort survived but something very bad must have happened to him that forced him to flee and remain hidden for over a decade. He is not the type of man who would just hide in fear. He was accomplishing something. If I could get my hands on the prophecy, that would likely solve a few questions I have. He only knew with certainty that the beginning of the prophecy was still the same, from what he heard from his parents. But that was the only part they knew. The wording in a prophecy is of extreme importance. A single discrepancy in the contents could change everything. Tragically, the only person with the knowledge he needs is Albus Dumbledore, the most secretive person he knows. Are we there yet? The voice of Ron broke through the noise of the train moving over the tracks. He ignored it. Even the Dumbledore he knew from his past as a grandfather and a mentor, was only willing to share the most important information during his last moments of life. Even though he was the subject of the property itself. Are we there yet? Ron asked, louder this time. He may be willing to share some things with Neville one day when he is older. But why would he share anything with him? Harry Potter was not an important figure in this timeline. He was just the son of an aura and a talented muggle-born witch. Unfortunately, there was no easy alternative way to learn the contents of the prophecy. 
there may still be a copy at the ministry, but only Neville could get that one. To take that route, he would need to reveal everything to the boy, and he was not ready to know those things. Oh shit! I'm starting to think like the old man Harry realized. Are we there yet or not? Ron shouted again. Harry regretted sitting in the same compartment as the not-so-golden trio. He was initially going to sit with Hermione, but that compartment was quickly filled with several other first-year girls. Apparently, Lavender and Parvati were very popular among the young girls. That left him with few choices. So when Neville offered to sit with them at the end of the train, he accepted the offer without much consideration. Ron, you are being a bit rude, Neville said. Come on. He took the window seat. Ron pointed at Harry. Lest he can do is tell us, so, are we there yet? Shut up already. Harry snapped. Something he immediately regretted after seeing the startled faces of the three children. I'm sorry Ron, I didn't mean to, ah oh look. We are there. Harry pointed out of the window. The train station was finally in sight. Harry hurried to get off the train. He had no more patience to deal with kids. Harry. Someone called his name. Except for this one. He went down to one knee and let his little sister jump to him. I missed you too, Holly. Despite the short time they had known each other, Harry had become very attached to the little ball of sunshine that was his little sister. Too bad he could not say the same about the other one. Most of the letters he had sent from Hogwarts during the year, had been for her. He never had a sibling before so he didn't know if this was a normal feeling. Welcome back Harry. He was now welcomed by the sight of his mother. Ready to go home? There is a treacle pie waiting for you. She added with a warm smile. If I recall well enough, the last time, at the end of my first year, the only thing waiting for me at the house, was my aunt, yelling at me to hurry up to drop my junk in the cupboard so I could go clean the garage, this is quite the improvement. Were Harry's thoughts. I'm ready to go home. Chapter 60, Welcome Back The Potter family was having dinner together. Let me see it too. Lily was showing their son's report card from school to her husband James while Lyra asked to see it. Lily handed it to her. Here. A smirk appeared on Lyra's face. You only got acceptable, pfff, wait until I get to Hogwarts, I'm going to bring a lot of outstandings. Lyra, that's enough. Warned her mother. But mom, is true. I have been studying all year and I even have your notes for charms. There is no way I will not get a few o at least. Lyra, that's not what your mother is upset about, and you know it. Said James with a stern expression. The girl glanced at Harry. He wasn't even looking at her and instead, he just focused on enjoying his desert in peace. This appeared to make her angrier. Is it because of what I said of his grades? But who cares? Look. She pointed at Harry. He doesn't care at all what I say, dot. Lyra, that's quite enough. Said James. She looked at her brother again. He had just finished his piece of tart and was now licking the fork. He has been like a completely different person since he came back from the hospital. He doesn't seem to care about anything, is like he lost half his brain or something, dot. Enough. Shouted Lily. Go to your room, now. Lyra huffed in annoyance, threw the report card on the table, and rushed out of the kitchen. The kitchen remained in silence for a few seconds after Lyra slammed the door on her way out. It seems like my lack of reaction has backfired. Remarked Harry. Since arriving here and learning about what his previous self had done to Lyra, he had been extremely careful around his second sister. He had tried his best to avoid doing anything that could upset her. As if trying to compensate for the other Harry's actions. He ignored all of her attempts at upsetting him, thinking that she was just venting her frustrations about the treatment she had been receiving over the years. Harry thought that she deserved at least this much so he let her say whatever she wanted, thinking that eventually, she would become satisfied and stop. Harry, this is not your fault. Said James. No, I have been a terrible brother to her. Said Harry. And that was very much an understatement. That wasn't. Lily stopped herself before saying that wasn't you. That is not your responsibility. She said instead. Is not completely true, that was still part me. He didn't know why the previous Harry became that way, but he still felt somewhat responsible for his behavior. Is something wrong? They have just noticed Holly, who was sitting at her chair with an upset expression. Oh honey, everything is okay. 
we just had a little misunderstanding, that's all. Lily tried her best to calm her daughter. Do you want me to go talk with her? Asked James his wife. No, let me do it. I have been meaning to talk to her about a few things. Said Lily. I can take Holly to play for a bit. Offered Harry. The mood of the little girl improved immediately. Really? Sure, you know. I brought with me a set of exploding snaps. Why don't we try it out? He had found an old set from the 1800s in the room of requirement. The idea was to sell it, but after finding out that it wasn't particularly valuable, he decided to keep it. That game is a bit dangerous for a child, Harry. Said Lily. You are exaggerating, Lily. The modern sets come with several safety features. Is completely secure. James brushed off her worries. Fine, but only for an hour. Then is bedtime for you, little lady. She hugged her daughter before placing her down so she could go with Harry. Why don't you wait for me at the library, Holly? I'll go get the cards from my bag. Harry looked around the kitchen until he spotted the elf, waiting on a corner. Oh, before I forget, Mipsy. Yes, Master Harry. Is there anything you need? The elf approached. No, I just wanted to say that the treacle tart was delicious. I would love to eat it again sometime. The elf had a bright smile. Thank you, Master Harry. I can make it again any time you want. Don't take her on that offer, Harry, you'll get fat. His father warned. Okay, I'm going to take Holly to the library and then I'll go check on Lyra, don't let her wait too long by herself, Harry. And remember to bring her to her room by eight o'clock. Said her mother. Of course mom. Harry was about to leave the kitchen when he noticed his father. It seemed like he wanted to say something. Harry, tonight after you take Holly back, I want you to come talk with me at my studio. There are some important things we must discuss. I know you must be tired, but I may have to leave for a work trip tomorrow, so we need to talk tonight. Sure dad, I'll be there in an hour, Harry promised. After putting out the fire at the library and escorting his little sister safely to her room, Harry made his way to his father's office. Man, those exploding snaps were truly dangerous. I don't remember them being so, potent. He could not help but wonder if that set was defective. I'll have to buy some new ones. No more second-hand stuff. He promised himself. Chapter 61, A New Family Member Harry knocked twice on the door before opening it and walked inside his father's studio. James was sitting already behind his deck, waiting for him. As soon as Harry sat down, his father pushed a newspaper towards him. Harry took a glance at the front page. He was already very familiar with this one, it had a picture of Lucius Malfoy followed by an article about his murder and how the Aurora were incompetent for failing to find the culprit. The Aurora department as a whole has been getting a lot of criticism lately, the source of most of it being the Prophet newspaper. Did you do this? His father did not beat around the bush and asked directly. Yes. Harry answered with the same directness. James looked surprised for a moment. It could be because he didn't truly expect his son to be the one responsible, or maybe because he didn't think that Harry would admit it so quickly. How, no, why did you do that, Harry? Among other things. I needed information about Voldemort's plans. Malfoy has always been one of his most trusted followers. He also hired an assassin to kill Neville, so is not like the man was innocent by any means. That's not the point, Harry. You can't decide that by yourself. Look, I understand you come from a different era and fought in a bloody war. But here and now, we have laws and rules we must respect, otherwise, everything collapses. I do understand what you are trying to say, but this was a necessary measure. Remaining in the dark about that maniac plans, just puts everyone in massive danger. James let out a sigh. He knew there was no point in continuing that argument. Their points of view were very different. And, did you get the information you wanted so badly? I doubt it was easy to make that man talk. It wasn't that hard. And I did find some interesting things. But instead of telling you, is best if I show you. Do you have pensive here? James made a shocked face. A pensive. Harry, do you know how rare those things are? Even in the entire ministry, we only have two and one of them is for the exclusive use of the unspeakables. MMM, is that so? That's fine then, I had a chance to acquire one very recently. Hold on, let me call him first. Call who? 
James looked very confused now. Dobby, come here. Harry called. After a loud pop, an elf appeared on top of the desk. Master Harry called. Master Harry, son, where did you get a house elf from? Wait, did he say Dobby, that name sounds familiar. James muttered. Harry was about to address the elf when saw his father slam his hands on the desk. Dobby, that's Malfoy's house elf. We have been looking for him since the murder. Shouted his father. Yes, he was. Admitted Harry. Lady Malfoy and her son called for him repeatedly but never appeared in front of them, we all assumed he was killed the same day that Malfoy did. James' eyes moved from the elf to his son. Dobby doesn't answer to evil masters anymore. Shouted the elf, taking James by surprise. Dobby only answers to Master Harry and no one else, Master Harry saved Dobby. Okay, Dobby. I think he understands now. Said Harry. The elf nodded. Is there something Master Harry needs of Dobby? There is. Remember that room in Hogwarts where I store things. Dobby knows. Good, I need something called a pensive. It looks like a small fountain made of white marble. There is a silver liquid inside it. I need you to bring it here with utmost care. Right away, Master Harry. The elf disappeared. So you are his master now, that would explain how he got through the house protections. Harry shrugged. It wasn't something I planned. Dobby came to find me at Hogwarts. He had been wandering around for weeks without knowing what to do with his newfound freedom. Malfoy was needlessly cruel to him, but it gave him a purpose. So I told him that if he wanted, he could come to work for me and Dobby agreed. It was true he didn't plan for this, but having Dobby back with him, has been a coincidence he was very happy about. Now he could give his old friend a family that would treat him properly. I see. Is he going to live here from now on? That would be great. I don't know for how long he can stay at Hogwarts before Dumbledore notices he has an extra elf in the kitchens. We will need to inform the family and Mipsy, of course. They heard another pop near the entrance of the room. Harry turned around and saw Dobby levitating the pensive with his magic. Just leave it over here. Harry pointed. Thank you, Dobby. No problem, Master Harry. Should I go back to the castle? No need, this will be your house from now on. But we must inform my mother and the other house elf before you can move around freely. For the moment stay right here. My father and I have a few more things to discuss. Dobby nodded happily. Dobby has a new home. James had left his seat and was now observing the pensive with fascination. You really got a pensive, by Merlin, where did you? It was at that moment that James noticed an inscription at the base of the pensive. The word Malfoy was beautifully carved in the marble. Harry, you stole this from Malfoy. James huffed angrily. Technically, Dobby stole it. Harry pointed at the elf. Dobby did. The elf admitted proudly. Harry. James frowned. The man didn't need it anymore. James was about to shout again when Harry stopped him. Wait until you see this. I can guarantee that you won't care about a few stolen items afterward. A few. James raised an eyebrow. Harry got next to the pensive and used his wand to pull a strand of memories that he carefully deposited inside the silvery liquid. Go ahead. Chapter 62, Moral Dilemma James looked much paler when his face came out of the pensive. That bastard. I can't believe, Malfoy. They think they can just go after my family. Do you understand now? Harry asked calmly. James went back to his desk and collapsed on the chair. He took a minute to collect himself before speaking again. I do understand what is at stake, Harry. But don't think you can gloss over everything I saw you do in there, using Crucios to torture, and the killing curse, those are their way of doing things. Harry did not react in the least. Would it have been more morally acceptable if I had tortured and killed that man using legal spells? I could have conjured a hundred needles to stab him all over and finished him by blowing his head with a reducto. Besides, I had a good reason to use specifically those spells. Care to explain? Asked James. Now that I understand a bit better the detection methods the Aurors use, I decided to leave a clue that could lead to the investigation of some rival dark wizard, after all, as you said, the unforgivable are some of their favorite spells. The ones used by his followers. You wanted to guide the investigation to other members of his inner circle, in hopes the Aurors would find some incriminatory evidence that we could use against them. James could guess. Harry nodded. Is not a bad plan, 
although a cold-blooded one. Using the unforgivable curses for such misdirection. James didn't feel that Harry's actions were justified. Did it work thought? James shook his head. I'm not in charge of that investigation so I don't have all the details. But for the things I have heard, no important moves are being made against any pure blood lord. You have to understand that all of those lords hold a great deal of power in the ministry. We can't even open an investigation without some seriously damning evidence on them. James looked at the pensive. Obviously, we cannot use your memories, the only one who would end up in Azkaban would be you. Not that putting them in that prison will do much, Voldemort can control the Dementors. It's best to eliminate them. Said Harry. Harry. James said with a warning tone. For what Malfoy has revealed, we are not fighting the real Dark Lord anymore, but a pretender with a lot of political power. True. Admitted Harry. The one in charge now is that Lord Parkinson. I don't really know much about that man. I have only met his daughter a few times. I do know him a bit. I still attend some meetings of the Wizard Gamot, when there is some ridiculous law they are trying to implement, and Lord Parkinson is always there, that man doesn't miss a single meeting. He is a very serious and quiet person. His political views are even more extreme than the majority of the conservatives. He had voted for some very controversial laws, but regardless, he seems to be well respected among his peers. Now I know why. You need to be careful around him. He is the one who wants you dead the most, and the one who ordered those Death Eaters to attack me and Mom in that alley. Yes, that was, wait a moment. James seemed to have realized something. That was you, wasn't it? He pointed at Harry. Yes, I was there too, what are you getting at? Harry tilted his head. Not that. You were the one who killed those men. There was no mysterious man with a black robe who showed up just in time to save you and your mother. You know, when you say it like that out loud, it does sound hard to believe. And of course, it was me, I thought you had already reached that conclusion ages ago. I spent two months looking all over the country for that mysterious hooded man. James lamented. Sorry about that. James sighed in defeat. What a waste of time. Can we go back to the topic at hand? Asked Harry. James placed his hands on the table. Fine, for the moment, you need to stop playing vigilante. No more going around kidnapping, torturing, and killing, I can't believe I have to ask for his. Me neither, am I supposed to do nothing at all? Harry huffed. We are dealing with a different enemy than the one you know. This is a battle of politics and corruption. I hate politics. Said Harry. I don't love them either. I'm going to need some time to process this information. I also need to investigate a few things at the Ministry. Said James. According to Malify, at least half of the Auror Department is corrupt and already in their pockets. Harry decided to remind him. I know who can I trust in there. You don't need to worry about me. That's my job. Fine, just be careful. James looked happy to see his son's concern for him. It's best if you take that memory out of the pensive. What are you going to tell Mom? Harry asked while retrieving the memory with his wand and reabsorbing it into himself. Almost everything. I may skip the kidnapping and torture thought, but she will want to know the rest. Before you were born, she was fighting at my side against Voldemort and his followers. I know she is amazing. He just didn't want her to be in danger, that was all. She is. You should go to bed now. We can talk more on the weekend when I come back. Said. James. You can leave Dobby here, I'll have Mipsy help him settle. Harry turned to look at the elf, who had been waiting patiently at one side. You heard him Dobby. Be nice with my family. It will also be your family from now on. Of course Master Harry. Dobby will be the bestest elf. When Harry was about to open the door to leave, his father called him again. Oh, and Harry. Yes. He turned around. You are grounded. And I just want to say that the political faction of the conservative wizards has nothing to do with the U.S. political party. I just gave them that name because they are the ones trying to preserve the old traditional values of the magical word. And calling them the preservatives just sounded wrong. Chapter 63, Life at Home Harry spent the rest of the week getting used to his life at home. He would spend most of his free time either with Holly and his mother or reading something from the library. The Potter Library was massive and some of the books found on the upper shelves were fairly old, dating back over five centuries. However, 
he had yet to find any book containing a piece of useful magic, like some ritual, chant, or conjuration he didn't know about. The ones displayed were, for the most part, fantasy tales, diaries, and historical books, as well as a big section dedicated to cheesy romance novels that Harry had the feeling were put there by his mother. The spell books he found, only contained common magic, like cleaning charms, cosmetic ones, or magic that you would usually learn at Hogwarts. Harry was convinced that an old family like his, must have a lot more interesting tomes than the ones found at the library, but maybe those were placed in a more secure location. It was something he would have to ask his father when he returned. This is starting to get boring though. He wanted to do some magic training, but couldn't do it inside the house. Not with his two little sisters there. Wait, what about that room? He just recalled it. The safe room underneath the manor. From what his father said back then, that place has some powerful protections that would make it an ideal place to practice his spells. This was going to be something else to ask him tonight when he came back from his working trip. Harry glanced at the grandfather clock located in a corner of the library. He should be here in a few hours. Mom said he promised to be here for dinner time. Pop. Two elves appeared in the library. Both of them were carrying a tray with tea and some food. Master Potter, I have brought you some red tea and a slice of treacle tart, Mipsy said with a polite smile. And Dobby got Master Harry some of that too. And chocolate, Dobby's favorite, Dot. The little elf buried up and ran to his side before presenting the tray to him. Seeing this, Mipsy increased her pace and did the same. Master Harry likes red tea the best, and treacle tart is his favorite. But Dobby got here first. Does Master Harry not like what Dobby brought for him? The elf had fetched him some green tea and chocolate treats. The two elves haven't been getting along as well as one would expect. Dobby wanted to make himself useful to the family, while Mipsy, who had served the potter for her whole life, was very territorial and refused to give Dobby an easy time. Okay, that's enough of this, you two, Harry said with a stern tone. Master Harry. The two elves looked at him with a hint of fear. There weren't many things more terrifying to a house elf than feeling they have failed their master and upset them. This rivalry has to stop, this is not a competition. Mipsy, you have been a house for a long time and you have done a wonderful job. No one will ever take your position away from you. You will be part of this family for as long as you want. Dobby just wants the same, to be part of the family and feel useful and wanted. Can you help him with that, instead of trying to compete with each other? Yes Master Harry. Of course. I'm very sorry for my behavior. Mipsy said with her head hanging low. And Dobby is sorry for not knowing what Master Harry liked the most, Dot. That's fine, I don't hate green tea, and I like chocolate as well. So, thank you, Dobby. Do we take back one of the trays, Master Harry? Asked Mipsy. No, just set them up on the table. I'll do what I can with them. The elves left the food on the table located in the brightest corner of the library and left. Oh, you are here. The newcomer spoke with disappointment. Speaking of not getting along. Harry thought of his second sister. She has been mostly ignoring his existence since their mother scolded her on the night of his return. I don't have many places to be. I am grounded after all. Not that he had much of a reason to leave the house at the moment. You are grounded too, never mind that. I'll just grab a book and leave. Lyra was about to walk away when Harry called for her. I have some extra tea and sweets if you want to accompany me. He offered. You want me to have tea with you, do you have any idea of how weird that sounds to me? Her voice was getting progressively louder. I am aware it may seem odd, considering how strainer our relationship was. Strained. You hated me to death, and to be fair, I felt the same way. You never gave me any reason to feel otherwise. Fair enough. I don't remember most of the things that happened back then, but I can say that I'm extremely sorry for it. You didn't deserve any of that. Who are you, Dot? Lyra screamed. My brother would never say something like that. He would never apologize for the shitty things he did and would never ever invite me to have tea with him, lest he was planning on poisoning the cups, Dot. Harry waited patiently and allowed her to vent her frustrations, she seemed to have been holding them inside for a while. At first, I thought you were making up the whole I don't remember anything to not get in trouble with mom and dad for what you did. But the Harry I know would not have lasted a day without going back this usual hateful self, much less an entire year. She continued. But now, I don't know how to talk with you anymore, 
my brother was a jerk, but he was a jerk I was familiar with. You are like a completely different person and I feel like you have become, a stranger to me. Well, that has an easy solution. Harry pointed to one of the chairs. Come sit with me. Have some tea and we can have a proper conversation. Can I really? Said Lyra with hesitation. Please. Harry offered her a seat again and she took it. Lyra looked down at the piece of treacle tart. Mipsy had spent the entire week making those, you really like them, hi, dot. Yes, but I'm going to have to ask her to slow down, lest I will grow tired of it, or become very fat, Harry exclaimed. Lyra chuckled. Yeah, Mipsy can be very enthusiastic sometimes. By the way, that elf that you brought is super weird. Really, how so? Harry smiled and let his sister talk. The next hour flew by as he talked with his sister, who he finally had a chance to know. Chapter 64, Plans for the Summer Do we have a secret library by any chance? Harry asked directly during their next private conversation. Where does this come from? Of course, we don't have a secret library. Lily Potter interjected. If we had something like that, your father would never have kept something like that from me, right James? His mother had insisted on participating in their meetings from now on since she wanted to be more involved in any decision they made. Harry had told them more or less his whole story and everything he went through during the war. Only skipped a few details he wanted to keep for himself, like the fact that he had been married to Ginny. His family was very familiar with the Weasleys already and he didn't want things to become weird between them. Lily looked at her son. She knew that he was not going to give up on fighting against Voldemort, so she wanted to be of help the best she could. Harry looked unconvinced by this. Really? Such an old wizard family doesn't have any obscure tome stored somewhere. Lily noticed James' eyes flinch for just a moment. James, is there something you want to say? You are not hiding books from me, right? She looked deeply offended now. Is not like that, Lily. I swear. How could you, James Potter? Let me explain, please. James begged his wife. She leaned back on the chair and crossed her arms. Fine, you better have a good explanation for this. I didn't do this. It's just something I heard from my father. During my grandfather's era, the ministry had started the process of banning several branches of magic that had been previously legal. Not only did the practice become forbidden but also the possession and distribution of books or scrolls containing those types of magic. And our family had books of such forbidden branches of magic, Harry stated. Everyone did at the time said James. What kind of books are we talking about? What branches of magic? Asked Lily with interest. I haven't seen them myself and didn't ask either, so I can't say. Never had the interest of risk getting arrested, to be honest. I got into enough trouble during my school days. Said James. So, are they hidden inside the house? Harry wanted to know. Didn't you hear what I just said? They are illegal. You could end up in Azkaban just by reading one of them. I am of the belief that no knowledge should be forbidden, just certain practices. Said Harry. That's right, no one should stop us from learning. Lily agreed with her son. When the two pairs of bright green eyes landed on him. James Potter knew the fight was already lost. Very well, the books are stored in a secret compartment inside the family vault, at Gringotts. Fantastic, when can go take a look. Harry requested. James looked troubled. This weekend is going to be impossible. I have too much paperwork to finish. Oh, but next week we have the girls coming home. Said Lily. Right, we, you will have to wait until the weekends after that. Two weeks from now, we can go visit the vaults. James didn't seem very excited about the prospect. Sorry, but who's coming next week? Asked Harry. The only visit he was aware of was the one from Remus who was going to take a vacation next month and visit during Harry's birthday. I was planning on telling you tomorrow, I just finished talking the details with their mothers this same afternoon. Your sister's friends are going to spend the next weekend at home with us. Lyra's friends. Wait, but that means that. Yes, one is Astoria Greengrass, you already know her oldest sister, Daphne. The other one is Ginny Weasley, you may have met her brother, Ron. He is in your year. Well. You did already. James was about to say something. James. But Lily cut whatever her husband was going to say. Is that so? 
Harry wasn't paying attention. It seems like I will have a chance to meet this world's version of Ginny a bit earlier than expected. Harry, is everything okay? Asked Lily. Yes, everything is fine, Mom. I was just thinking about some things, right, before I forget, I have another request for you, Dad. Another request? He asked with a hint of dread. What was it going to be now? As long as is nothing too illegal, I'll be happy to help. I need a safe room to practice magic during the summers. A safe room? Asked James. You want to practice magic during the summer? Said Lily. Yes, but I already have a place in mind. Remember that underground safe room where we arrived by flu? You want to use that basement? James considered the request. He knew that he wasn't going to be able to stop Harry from doing magic during the summer, so giving him a safe place where no one else could get hurt was not a bad idea. I suppose is safe, the walls have been heavily reinforced against destruction. What about Hogwarts rules? You know he is not allowed to perform magic during the summers. Even if we let him, the trace of his wand will alert the ministry. Said Lily. James looked at his son for an answer. I have a spare wand without a trace. Said Harry. What? Lily looked shocked. Why am I not surprised? James shrugged. Can I see that wand? Harry lifted his left arm and a wand appeared from the holster. You got a holster too. James examined the wand. I assume you didn't get this from Ollivander. He would never sell an untraced wand. Or even a spare wand at that. No, I bought that from Borgen and Burks. You went to Nocturne Alley. Lily exclaimed. If they are frightened about something like this, it may be better not to tell them about the stuff I crafted. Harry considered. By the looks that his mother was giving him, he may be about to be grounded again. Chapter 65, Old Politics What are you reading? Lyra sat down on the couch next to him. Harry lifted his gaze from the old tome to look at his sister before answering. It is a diary written by Tobias Potter, back in 1710. He worked at the Ministry of Magic during its early years. That sounds, interesting, she said but her expression indicated otherwise. I do think it's interesting to know how people lived back during the beginning of the modern wizard society. And besides, it is by learning from the past that we can avoid repeating the same mistakes. You sometimes talk like an old man. Lyra pointed out. I do get that a lot. Wait, you said that this, something Potter. Tobias Potter. Harry corrected. Yes, that one. That guy was working at the ministry during its early days in the 1700s. But shouldn't the ministry be a lot older than that? The ministry was founded in 1707, just three years before this was written, and 300 years can be considered very old already, Harry explained. Yes but, isn't Hogwarts like a thousand years old? So there were wizards and witches around back then, who was in charge of the country? Lyra asked. A council of wizards used to rule over magical Britain back then. They were the lords and ladies from the most powerful and ancient families of the time. That sounds like the same we have now, with the wizard Gamot. Right. Wizen Gamot, has Dad been teaching you about this sort of thing already? This didn't seem like a topic she would choose to learn on her own. Harry knew his sister was smart and liked to read, but she was not Hermione. She would not take on a thousand pages ancient tome about the rules and regulations of a chamber of commerce from the 1800s, just for some light reading during the weekend. Lyra shrugged. He gave me a few lessons about the workings of the ministry a while ago. He said it was especially important to us since our family is also a member of this Wizengamot thing. It is, and to answer your question, the current government shares some similarities with the old wizard council. But there are at least two very important differences. He raised one finger. The first one is the amount of members and the requisites to join the current government. The old council was composed of only eleven seats, who held absolute power over the rules and laws. The Wizengamot has 50 members. Basically, every wizard family who was around during the forming of the ministry got a seat in it. This meant a greater variety of opinions and beliefs were now present. Also, the most ancient families were now wielding the same amount of power and authority that much newer ones. I bet those old fogies didn't like that one bit. Lyra grinned. The potters were part of these old fogies. Harry glanced at the time on his lap. This was written by the youngest brother of Arthur Potter. Former member of the Wizard Council. And for what it says about him, 
the old Lord Potter was very supportive of the change and saw it as the beginning of a new golden age for all magical folk. He pondered for a moment. Of course, not everyone was that supportive of these changes. MMM, and the second difference? Lyra questioned. That would be, the creation of the I.C.W. Oh, I know that one. Lyra said with excitement. That is the International Confederation of Wizards, dot. Right, among other things, the I.C.W dictated some baseline rights and laws for all the magical countries to follow. Further limiting the influence of these ancient families. Of course, this did not stop the most conservative faction of the Wizengamot from trying to pass laws that would go against some of those baselines set by the ICW. Harry wasn't sure what they were trying to accomplish with this as they would never allow these to hold. But that was something only the old families knew. Wow, you know a lot about old politics. Lyra looked impressed. Actually, is the contrary, it is because I don't know a lot about it, that I need to read all of these tiresome books. It looks like my new brother is a bookworm. Lyra chuckled. She had taken to referring to him as her new brother in an attempt to drive a clear distinction between the old Harry and the current one. He could only wait until she gets used to him for long enough that she can start calling him just Harry or brother. I don't understand how you got those grades if are so smart. You need to try harder next year. I know you can do better. She tried to encourage him. He could tell that she was sincere this time so he offered her a smile and a thank you. His father had already scolded him for his grades. Not because they were bad, but because they were too unusual. After all, no one is average at everything. Harry could only say that he was trying his best. After all, he was playing outside his comfort zone now. He never had the need to hold back before. Everyone who knew him, already knew what he was capable of. But now he has to pretend that he is just one more student. MMMM. They heard the sound of someone mumbling from the nearby couch, where Holly was sleeping. She was the original reason for Harry's visit to the library this afternoon. She had urged that he read her a story, only to fall asleep around ten minutes into his reading. She won't wake up that easily. Commented Lyra. She looks peaceful. Harry looked at his little sister with a grin. Yeah, she does now, the moment she opens her eyes is going to start demanding stuff, eh, I almost forgot. Lyra moved her green eyes away from Holly and looked at her brother. Yes, what is it? My friends, Ginny and Astoria are coming to stay at the manor for the weekend. I know, Mom told me about it. Said Harry. I just wanted to give you a heads up. Astoria is a bit weird and almost never talks. Ginny is usually very energetic and happy-going, but she may act a bit strange around you. Harry looked surprised at hearing this. How so? Have we met before? So don't remember any of that either, hey? Then I guess it's best if I just tell you. She came here almost two years ago, and you did meet her, well, sort of. It didn't end well for her. Let me tell you what happened. Chapter 66, Visitors Welcome. Lily greeted the duo of newcomers. Out of the fireplace, came a young woman wearing a beautiful green dress, followed by a little girl. Greetings, Lady Potter. The woman made an elegant short reverence. How many times do I have to tell you to call me Lily? The redhead frowned slightly before moving her eyes to the little girl. Hello, Astoria. We are going to have so much fun this weekend. The little girl looked up at Lily with an expression completely devoid of emotion and nodded. Harry and his two sisters were left waiting on one side, with the two house elves waiting behind them. It was a show of respect among old families to have the entire house present to greet important guests. Since his father was still working at the ministry, this was the entire Potter family. Harry was sure that Molly Weasley was not going to care for etiquette, but Lady Greengrass certainly would. His eyes were drawn to the young woman, who didn't look a day older than twenty-five. He could see where Daphne got her looks from. Lady Greengrass was a stunningly beautiful woman. Long blonde hair, clear blue eyes that shone like sapphires, and the elegant dress she was wearing showed just enough to tell that she had a perfect figure. Lord Greengrass is one lucky bastard. He could not help but to think. He hurried up to remove his eyes from Daphne's mother before anyone noticed it and looked at the daughter, Astoria. The girl was small, even for her age. But her most striking feature was her long black hair. It wasn't just black, but the deepest shade of charcoal black he had ever seen, it looked almost unnatural. He could also feel something strange in the girl's magic. 
his senses were not sharp enough to pinpoint exactly what it was. But he recalled hearing some strange rumors about the Greengrass family having a generational curse that was passed from parents to children. Hello. His train of thought came to a halt when he saw his little sister move from her spot at his side and run towards the guests in a very unladylike manner. I guess her patience ran out. Harry knew she was not going to hold in place for too long. Both Astoria and her mother turned their heads at the same time and saw the little girl dashing at them. Lily made a quick maneuver and intercepted her daughter before she could do something very impolite and held her in her arms. Holly, I told you to wait with your siblings until I called for you, Dot. But Mom. She pouted. I'm sorry about this. I told them Abu. Lady Greengrass raised her hand to interrupt. It's fine, lad no, Lily. I am not as strict as my husband when it comes to following old traditions. She looked at Holly and smiled. Greetings. Little Miss. I Holly, I'm five years old already. What's your name? Holly held her palm out to indicate she was, that many. I am Selene Greengrass and this is my youngest daughter, Astoria. Astoria looked at Holly and nodded. How many years do you have? Holly asked innocently at Lady Greengrass. Lily's eyes opened widely and was about to scold her daughter when Selene spoke while maintaining a polite smile. I forgot, Selene said without skipping a beat. Holly looked aghast at hearing this. You forgot? How? She could not comprehend how could someone forget about something so important. She would be counting the days until her next birthday if she knew how. My dear, you will one day learn that when a witch reaches a certain age, they will stop counting the years, and eventually, they will forget about it, Selene said with a mischievous smile. Holly still looked confused. But mom did not forget, she told me she is 30 mmmm. Lily hurried to cover her mouth. That's enough of you, little rascal. Let's introduce your siblings, well, you already know my other daughter quite well. Yes, I do. Greetings Lyra, it's nice to see you again. Said Selene. Lyra greeted Lady Greengrass with an elegant curtsy she had been practicing since last year. Hello, Lyra Astoria finally spoke her two first words. Lyra smiled and got closer to Astoria. Hi Tori. This is going to be such a fun weekend. This was the first time she had friends staying over at her house so Lyra was extremely excited about the experience. Looking forward, Astoria spoke once more. Every sound she produced had the same flat intonation, and her facial expression never changed. She is very talkative today, normally she would not say more than two words a day. That goes to show how happy she is explained Selene. Her blue eyes then moved until they landed on Harry. And this must be Harry Potter. My eldest daughter has mentioned you several times during the last year. She rarely talks about other people, you must have made a powerful impression on her. Yes, we, got along, I think. Is a pleasure to meet you, Lady Greengrass, and you too, Astoria. Harry had no idea what Daphne told her parents about but it made him somewhat uneasy. The black-haired girl stared directly at him for several seconds, and just when it was starting to become uncomfortable, she nodded and looked away. Selene got closer to Lily and spoke softly. If anything happens, you know how to contact us, right? Yes don't worry, Selene. Everything is going to be great and I'll take care of her like she was one of my own. Selene nodded. I know you will, that's why I agree to let her stay. Well then, I must be going now. Don't you want to stay a bit longer, Molly should be about to arrive. Suggested Lily. Selene flinched. I... I have some important matters to take care of. I'm sure she will understand. After saying goodbye to her daughter, she moved smoothly towards the fireplace and disappeared in a burst of green fire. Lily grinned. She doesn't get along very well with Molly. I think their personalities are a bit too different. A bit. Lyra raised an eyebrow. Not even a minute after the departure of Lady Greengrass, the fireplace came alive again. They are here already. Said Lily. Chapter 67, Meet the Weasleys A big woman with short red hair came out of the fireplace. When is James going to change that name? Marauder's Nest makes it sound like I'm visiting his bachelor dwelling. Harry was filled with nostalgia when he saw the woman he once considered a mother figure. She was just like he remembered her. Lily chuckled at Molly's comment. I have already told him that way too many times. He refuses to change it because Remus finds it amusing. Another burst of flames and a very young girl with long vibrant red hair appeared into the room. Molly went to give Lily a hug. 
It's good to see you again, Lily. Hey, what about me? Holly, who was still in her mother's arms, complained for being ignored. Of course you too. Holly. And you know what, there is a delicious chocolate cake waiting for you if you come to visit me this summer. Yes, we are going, Holly told her mother in the most commanding voice she could muster. Oh, Molly. You don't have to bake cakes every time we visit you. Lily knew that the Weasleys didn't have a house elf and most of the chores fell on Molly's shoulders. Please, is not bother at all. I have already baked five of them since my boys came back from school. And it's only been two weeks. Hello Miss Weasley, hello Ginny. Lyra went to greet them. Molly gave her an affectionate hug. Hello dear. Hi Lyra. Ginny grinned happily at seeing her friend again. Molly released his sister and looked at Astoria, who had yet to make a noise since her mother left. You must be Astoria. Molly had only met the eldest daughter so far because Astoria rarely leaves the house. The raven-haired girl nodded. Well, I am Molly Weasley. Nice to meet you, Astoria. Harry noticed something unusual. Molly never tried to hug Astoria. Anyone who knew the Weasley matriarch could tell how strange that was. He could only conclude that, whatever was wrong with Astoria, Molly knew about it and was being respectful. You have yet to properly meet my son, Harry. Lily pointed at him. Ah yes, Harry. I have been waiting to meet you. You never came to visit with your mother and sister. Molly smiled at him. He noticed Ginny looking at him for a moment before moving her face away. Harry wanted to sigh in defeat. The person he wanted to meet again the most, was very unlikely to talk to him now. His sister told him what happened back then. It was almost two years ago. Lyra and Ginny had only been friends for a few months when she was invited to the Potter Manor. Lily had recently bought the newest boy who lived books to read to Holly, who was three years old at the time. So when Lyra discovered that Ginny was a huge fan of those books, she urged the girl to visit the library and read the newest ones. Ginny became very enthusiastic at hearing this and agreed. They went inside and failed to notice the boy reading quietly in one of the sofas. Lyra started to show her all the books they had and Ginny was delighted looking at everything. She started to speak about the boy who lived books she had read at home and then asked Lyra if she thought that Neville Longbottom would be that incredible in real life. According to Laura's recount of the events, it was at this moment that she heard someone approach. When she turned around and saw it was her brother, she became immediately worried. Harry looked even more angry than usual at this point. He immediately started to look at Ginny, who didn't understand what was going on, as she hadn't even been introduced to him yet and had only briefly heard that she had a brother. Harry went on a rant about how stupid Ginny was to believe everything she read in those books. When Lyra stood up to him and was about to yell at him to leave them alone, Harry pushed her very hard and she fell backward. As Lyra fell, she ended up pushing Ginny, who was trying to stand up. Ginny tripped and hit her head against the corner of one of the shelves and got a cut on the side of her face, right next to her right eye. Harry went away while screaming something at them and Lyra hurried to call their mother, who took them both to Saints Mungo in a hustle. In the end, neither of them told anyone what truly happened. They only told Lily that Ginny fell down while running through the library. But Lyra was relatively sure that at least their mother knew the truth. Harry was also convinced that Ginny never told her family what happened at all. Had the Weasley twins known that he had hurt their beloved sister, he would have been mercilessly pranked for the entire year at the very least. And Ron would never talk to him. Even if he pretends that he doesn't care about Ginny. Harry knew very well how protective he could get. He doesn't understand why neither of them told the truth. Maybe there was a small party of Lyra that wanted to protect her brother from trouble, no matter how much he deserved it. But for Ginny, he had no idea. Maybe she didn't want to risk her friendship with Lyra. Getting his thoughts back in order, Harry looked at Molly and Ginny. Greetings, Miss Weasley and Ginny. Nice to meet you. How polite. He looks just like his father. Commented Molly. Yes, but he has my eyes. Added Lily. My son Ron told me you also got sorted into Greyfinder. Did you enjoy your first year? Molly asked. Well. I fought some acromantulas and killed two men, one of them being my teacher, so it was a very average Hogwarts year for me, I suppose. It was all right. Harry offered. Molly chuckled. The first year can be stressful. It will get more fun from here on. Let's hope not too fun. Yes, I'm sure it will. He wouldn't mind a quiet year for once though. Ginny, go ahead and say hello to Harry at least. 
urged Molly. Age high. She said very awkwardly before looking away. Don't mind her, she can be very shy with boys. Molly apologizes to him before addressing his mother again. I'm very sorry Lily, but I can't stay for long. If I leave those beasts that I have for sons alone at home for too long, who knows what will happen when I come back. Molly said with a hint of dread. Chapter 68, Golems and Baths A golem made of stone rushed at him, in its hands was a dangerously looking iron sword. Harry dodged the sharp blade by moving to one side as this one came down in a vertical motion. The golem promptly recovered his posture and attacked again, this time with a horizontal slash aimed at his upper torso. With a fluid motion, Harry moved behind the golem, and as soon as he did, this one used its free hand to launch a backhanded punch at his face, forcing him to jump backward and put some distance between them. Harry made sure his wand was properly gripped, it would be very troublesome to stop the golem if it fell from his grasp. The room he was currently in was fairly small for training purposes, being only 5 square meters, 16,4 feet. This tight space just made facing an opponent armed with a blade a much more troublesome task. Beads of sweat fell across his face. How long it's been already? He was losing track of time as his exhaustion increased. The golem was not going to give him time to rest as the creature itself would never get tired of moving around, it could continue to fight until the magic powering its body was completely exhausted. The construct turned around and ran at him with a level of swiftness that one would think impossible for a being made of stone. It lunged forward as its body turned sideways, piercing the air with its long word, which was approaching at a tremendous speed towards his head. The blade passed right next to his face as he moved. Shit, that was dangerous. He cursed. Harry then jumped back, trying to create some breathing room between him and the golem but as soon as he did so, his back ended up hitting the wall. He had no more room to move. The golem did not hesitate to go for the killing move. The magical construct did not have the capability to think or make decisions. It merely follows the simple command that its creator gave it during the moment of its conception, and the command was. Kill the person in front of you. The golem will not stop for anything until its purpose has been carried out. Unless its creator intervenes. Finite incantatum. As the words left Harry's lips, the conjured sword in the golem's hand disappeared into nothingness and the golem itself crumbled down until it was no more than a pile of rubble. Reparo. The rubble flew against a wall that had a hole in it and transformed until the damage was completely fixed, leaving a flawless wall afterward. Harry collapsed on the floor and cleared the sweat from his forehead before it reached his eyes. He wasn't magically exhausted this time around, just physically. He had challenged himself to last for as long as he could against the construct without fighting back. But the main purpose of this training exercise was to evaluate the combat capabilities of the golems he could create at this moment. Construct creation was considered a side branch of transfiguration. Not a very popular one due to its limitations but a very useful piece of magic if you knew what you were doing. If he was in a disadvantageous situation where he had to face multiple competent enemies, the creation of several golems could even up the situation. These golems have some clear limitations. They could only be made from available material in your surroundings and this meant that most of the time, they would be made of dirt or rock. They only lasted for a short period of time. One has to give them a fraction of their magic during their creation, after that, the golem would function using this magic as fuel and will continue to do so until the magic runs out. Afterward, it will crumble and transform back into whatever material was used to form it. The last and most important limitation was the knowledge. The golem was unable to do something that its creator was not knowledgeable about. For example, if the caster doesn't know the first thing about sword fighting, the golem will be as clueless as his creator when given a sword to fight with. This was also the reason why they were usually created in a very humanoid shape, instead of forming them like animals or giving them extra limbs. Overall, Harry was very satisfied with the test. His own sword skills could only be called average, especially compared to the one who taught him. But combined with the golem's might and speed, it had proven to be rather difficult to deal with. This should be good enough for today. He looked down at himself. His clothes were completely soaked in sweat. I need a nice bath, Tempus. Okay, there is plenty of time before lunch. He was not looking forward to that. After the girls arrived, Harry had basically, scoped out of there, and went to get some training. But he could not ignore them forever. He just couldn't stand the look of fear that Ginny was giving him. How do I even begin to fix that? Lyra had probably told her already about this amnesia and change of personality, otherwise, he could not imagine Ginny ever agreeing to come back here. 
but it seems that she is not completely convinced about his change. Should I apologize? He wondered. Does he need to once again request forgiveness for something he didn't do? He pondered while making his way to the second floor bathroom. There were two big bathrooms on this floor, one was meant for him and Lyra, while the other was for their parents. However, after one big fight when they were younger, Lyra had her room moved away from him and closer to their parents, leaving the entire area of the second floor to him, including the bathroom. He didn't hate that part, as this meant that he never had to worry about having someone else use his bathroom and could enter whenever he wanted. Master Harry he heard a pop and the panicked voice of an elf as he opened the door. He then heard some gasps and when he looked up, Harry found himself staring at three naked girls about to enter the big bathtub. Ginny hurried to cover herself with a towel. Lyra yelled at him while doing her best to cover her most important parts using her hands. Astoria didn't seem to care at all about his presence or make any attempt to cover herself. Harry closed the door and looked to his right, where Mipsy was looking at him with a troubled expression. Mistress Lyra and her friends wanted to take a bath but the other bathroom was being cleaned so I suggested they use this one, I tried to warn Master Harry but could not find you anywhere. Well yes, I was in the training room that is heavily warded against intrusions. He realized. Another pop could be heard. I found Master Harry, dot. Shouted Dobby. Master Harry must not enter that bathroom. The misses are using it. Harry sighed. Thanks Dobby. Chapter 69, The Cursed Girl Pervert Lyra muttered again while giving him a nasty look. Harry put his fork down. He has yet to take a single bite of the roasted chicken that Mipsy has prepared for lunch. I already told you it was an accident. Pervert, Astoria said, although she didn't seem to care a bit and was most likely repeating what Lyra was doing. Ginny had yet to say a single word. Her face was almost as red as her hair and she refused to look up from her plate. Mommy what a pervert. Holly asked innocently. Well, that's, that's a thing that you call the, Lyra, stop calling your brother that. Lily glanced at her daughter with a stern expression. But mom, he saw us. Lyra huffed. Calm down already, Lyra. I'm sure your brother didn't get to see much. And besides, you girls can relax, you have little to show yet. Give it a few more years. Lily then noticed the curious look that Holly was giving her and she knew the girl was about to start asking questions she did not want to answer, for a few more years at least. Don't ask me anything and you can have extra dessert. Yes. Holly celebrated with a happy face and went back to her food. Mom, how can you say that, Dot? Lyra looked down at her small chest. It is already growing. She mumbled. Astoria looked down and placed her hands on her completely flat chest. MMM. Can we talk about something else? Please. Begged Ginny. Fine, Dot. Lyra was also tired of this conversation. I'll let this one go, just this one time. Don't do it again, Dot. Lyra told Harry while trying to imitate her mother's stern look. You are most kind, my lady. Harry noticed her lips forming a smile for a short second before she hid it away and returned to her frown. He knew she wasn't truly angry with him and she understood the whole thing was an accident. But in a way, maybe she missed being angry at him, who knows. He can't claim to truly understand this sister of his, yet. Astoria just stared at him as usual before she began eating her food. And Ginny looked more embarrassed about the conversation than angry about what happened. Living in a small house with six brothers and two bathrooms, this was probably not the first time someone had walked on her while taking a bath. With lunch finally over, Harry went for some much-needed peace and quiet to the library. He read another old tome that gave him a bit of an insight into some of the oldest wizard families. After relaxing for a few hours and drinking some tea, he felt much better, but also needed to stretch his legs for a bit. Harry walked into the inner garden and spotted Astoria sitting by herself on one of the stone benches beneath a big apple tree. As he walked, Harry was able to spot several figures in the air. At first, he only saw Lyra and Ginny flying on their respective brooms and wondered why his mother left them to fly alone but then, he saw a third person hovering close by, it was his father. He must have returned while he was in the library. Harry looked back at Astoria. The little girl seemed distracted while reading some small book and failed to notice his approach. He decided to get closer and say something to the girl. Good evening, Astoria. Can I sit here? The bench was big enough for five people to sit comfortably. She lifted her face from her book to look at him with her violet eyes and gave him her usual nod. 
if she was displeased by his presence, she didn't show it in any way. It was impossible to read that girl. He sat down, leaving ample space between them to not make her uncomfortable. Why aren't you flying with them, Dot? Harry asked. He knew it wasn't for lack of brooms as his father had an ample collection of them. Cant Astoria answered. Those were the first and only words she had said to him so far. Other than calling him a pervert, earlier that day, he preferred to ignore that. Can't. Do you not know how to fly, because I'm sure my father will be delighted to teach you. Or perhaps there is another reason. She stared directly into his eyes. No magic. She said that and went back to her book. No magic. That's impossible. He was no censor but he could clearly feel magic coming from her. She was no squib, of that he was 100% sure. Could it be that? Some type of curses would eat away at the user's magic. Maybe her reserves are so small that her own body prevents her from using any of them, as a form of defense mechanism to avoid magical exhaustion. This could mean that she doesn't have enough magic to lift the magical broom. But if she can't even do that, then attending Hogwarts is probably out of the question. Is because of your curse then? For the first time, he got a reaction from her. Astoria quickly looked away from her book and stared at him. He interpreted that as a surprise. You know about it. Daphne. Your sister didn't tell me anything, don't be mad at her. He said. An intense stare. She is waiting for an explanation, he noticed. Harry felt a hint of satisfaction at finally being able to understand her a little bit at least. There are rumors about your family having a generational curse. After meeting you, let's just say I made an educated guess. And you just confirmed that I was right. She kept staring at him. Does Lyra know? She shook her head. Lyra was probably told that Astoria has some sort of illness that makes her like this. Don't worry. I won't tell anyone about this without your consent. She appeared to think for a moment before nodding at him and going back to her reading. Chapter 70, Encounter Late at Night He kept Astoria company until his father and the two girls came down. Oh, there you are Harry. Wanna fly a bit with your old man? James asked him with a grin. Maybe tomorrow is getting dark already and I'm sure mom would get mad if we were late for dinner, Harry stated. That's right, you two, come down already. James hollered. Tori, did you see us? Lyra said as she landed. Astroria noted at her. That was so fun. Ginny seemed to be in a much better mood now. Mom never lets me use the brooms at home. Then you better not tell Molly that I let you fly, that woman can be very scary when she is angry, James reminded the girl. Don't worry Mr. Potter, I can keep a secret, Ginny assured him. Good girl, and call me James. Let's go inside, we can play a game of exploding snap before dinner. Lyra said with excitement. Yes, let's do that, answered Ginny. Be very careful if you play in the library. That game can be very dangerous. Harry warned the girls. Lyra and Ginny gave him a confused look while James seemed to have realized something. Wait a minute. It was almost midnight when Harry opened his eyes. He gazed at his surroundings, feeling disoriented for a moment until he recognized being in one of the comfy sofas of the library. Right, I came here after dinner for some light reading. He looked down at the book that remained on his lap. Laws and Regulations, English Ministry of Magic, 1707. Maybe I should find a hobby. He considered. His body became immediately alert when he heard the sound of steps approaching and had to contain himself from jumping out of the sofa with his wand at the ready. Relax, you are at home he reminded himself. He then saw Ginny entering the library while carrying a small magical lamp. She didn't notice his presence and went directly to the section where the children's stories were placed. He could imagine what she was looking for. On the shelf to your left. Ginny let out a squeal at the sudden surprise and turned around. H. Harry. Please, lower your voice, everyone is sleeping. He whispered. Sorry, I just, I she got nervous all of a sudden. Probably was not prepared to encounter anyone here at this hour, much less him. It's okay, you haven't done anything wrong, trouble sleeping. He changed the subject. Ginny nodded. I thought reading something would help me. You could have asked one of the house elves to bring you a book. Ah. She hasn't thought about that because her house has no elves so Ginny was used to doing everything by herself. The boy who lived books are over here. Harry walked to one of the shelves. Holly has amassed quite the collection. 
Ginny went to her shelf and her expression became brighter when she saw all the books. So many. I haven't read many of these yet. Oh. Her smile fell and she glanced at Harry for a moment. You probably think I'm stupid for still reading these. No, I don't think you are stupid. Look, I'm sorry about what happened that day. Lyra told me that you don't remember anything from before your accident, she said that you changed, Ginny whispered. No, I don't remember any of it. But I'm still sorry to have caused such a terrible first impression of me, and for hurting you. Is okay, even my brother Ron says that I'm stupid for still liking those books, or believing that any of it is true. You are not stupid, Ginny. You are a bright witch but still need to discover what you are good at. Once you do, you can truly shine, and show everyone how amazing you can be. Then, for the first, Ginny gave him a sincere smile. Thanks, but, how can you know that? We just met, you don't know me. I can tell, I have a good eye for people, trust me. She grinned before looking back at the shelf of books. If I may, I can recommend you one. Neville Longbottom and the Mystical Cave. I found that one entertaining at least. Said Harry. You read them too. Ginny became shocked. Of course, I read one of them every night to Holly. Ah, right. For a moment she thought to have found another fan. My brother Bill used to read me books too. She said with a hint of nostalgia. Say, Harry, she whispered hesitantly. Can I ask you something? Yes. How is he in real life, you know, Neville Longbottom? Ginny asked. Harry could see a light blush decorating her cheeks. I should have expected that question. He thought. Shouldn't you ask your brother Ron? He is one of his closest friends. I'm sure he has many stories to tell about him. He won't tell me anything, he always yells at me to leave him alone and don't bother him with questions about his friends. Ginny huffed with furred eyebrows. I see. That does sound like Ron. Well, Neville is, a nice guy. That's it. Ginny tilted her head. You will meet him soon enough, then you can form your own opinion of him. MMM, I guess. She didn't seem satisfied with that. He was well aware of how obsessed she was with the boy who lived at this point. But, what was he supposed to do? Manipulate an eleven-year-old to like him more instead? Is that even something he wants? As close as they are, this is not his Ginny, this is a different version of her with her own ideas and dreams. No, is too early to worry about these things. The real Voldemort is still somewhere out there. Until that monster is dead for good. I cannot risk losing someone like that again. Harry? You look troubled with something. Ginny looked at him. Are you feeling sleepy perhaps? Ha, no, but going to bed is not a bad idea. He said. Why don't you take a book and I'll accompany you back to Lyra's room. The house is dark and easy to get lost in. Thank you, Harry, Lyra was right, you are very nice now, dot. Bonus chapter, chapter 71, a little adventure. Lyra, I don't think we should be doing this. Ginny didn't feel that this was right. It was Sunday morning and the three girls were sneaking around the manor basement. My brother has been doing something in secret all week. He disappears all of a sudden and not even Mipsy knows where he is. Lyra commented. She then felt a tug on her sleeve. It was Astoria looking at her. How? How did I find out then? Lyra guessed what the other girl wanted to ask. I was able to get it from Dobby. Isn't Dobby your family house elf too? How come he knows something and Mipsy doesn't? Wondered Ginny. Dobby is not the family house elf. He is Harry's personal elf. Lyra felt another tug from Astoria. I don't know where he got it from. My parents are very quiet about it. They also told me to not mention the elf's name to anyone. Is supposed to be a secret. Lyra glanced at the two girls. So don't say anything, okay? Both Ginny and Astoria nodded. So, if Dobby already told you what he's doing, why are going to spy on him again? Asked Ginny. He didn't tell me what he is doing just that he goes to some hidden room in the second basement. I don't think he was supposed to tell me that because afterward, he started hitting his head against the wall. He what? Ginny sounded horrified. Dobby does that sometimes, if he thinks he's done something wrong. He said he has to punish himself. Lyra explained. That's awful. Ginny exclaimed. Awful. Astoria agreed. Hey, 
is not my fault. Harry said that his previous master was very cruel to him and always told him to punish himself. Lyra explained. He must have been a terrible person. Do you know what happened to the previous master? Asked Ginny. No, I think my parents are hiding something important and is about Harry, said Lyra. Mysterious. Astoria muttered. She also felt there was something odd about him. Wow, you are very talkative today, Lyra observed. I still don't think is right to spy on him, Ginny added. You can consider it a payback for what happened yesterday. That was an accident, and you forgave for that already, remember, dot. Ginny pointed out. I did. Lyra admitted. But it doesn't mean that we can't get a bit of payback. She grinned at Ginny. Don't you want a bit of revenge? He probably got a good look at your butt. H. He did not. I had a towel. Ginny became flushed red. What about you, you didn't even try to cover? Lyra told Astoria. The other girl shrugged. You should care more about boys seeing you. That's for like, your boyfriend or something. Lyra didn't know a lot about those matters. But that's what the books her mother liked so much, always talk about. This basement is massive, do you know where we are going? Ginny changed the subject to something more important at the moment. They have been wandering the place for over 30 minutes already. I have only been here twice. I think mom had her old school books stored here, and some of her stuff from when she lived with her muggle family. But, I have never ventured this far. Lyra explained. The basement of the Potter Manor was not just one big room but it was instead separated in many corridors with several bifurcations along the way, making it very confusing to navigate. I'm sure this basement is bigger than my house. Ginny commented. I don't care about the size, but why did they have to make it so, maze-like? Lyra complained. At this rate, we are just going to get lost, and then we will get in trouble with your parents. Ginny was starting to panic. Calm down, we just nay mmmm. Lyra felt a hand covering her mouth all a sudden. It was Astoria the one who did it. Noise. The other two realized now that they were in complete silence. There was a bit of noise coming from somewhere nearby. SHHH. Lyra put a finger on her lips to tell her friends to remain in silence. Mostly to Ginny, she didn't need to ask that to Astoria. They followed the noise until they reached a big painting of some old man at the end of a short corridor. It has to be here. I can hear noise coming from behind the painting. Lyra whispered. Then, maybe there's some mechanism to open it. Try look. Password. Ginny was interrupted when the painting moved and the old man inside spoke to them. The three girls were startled and looked at the old man inside the painting. An enchanted portrait. I read about these. Hogwarts has many of them. I didn't know we had any here. Lyra observed the painting with great interest. Who is the old man thought? You think is an old ancestor or something? Asked Ginny. Password. The man asked again. Hello. Lyra greeted him with a smile. I'm Lyra Potter, I live here, I just want to go see my brother. I think he is on the other side so, can you let us pass? Password. The old man requested. I don't think he can say anything else. Ginny concluded. Then this is not like the paintings I read about, if we don't give him the password it will be impossible to get through. Said Lyra. Hello, sir. Can we get a clue about this password at least? Requested Ginny. Password. The old man replies. Never mind, he can't say anything else. Ginny gave up. Well. I have no idea what the password could be. Should I try something random, M, O, I know. The password is treacle tart. That's my brother's favorite. The old man looked at Lyra with a frown. Wrong. Is not that, let me think. What about, I love reading boring books. Wrong. The tone of the old man grew more stern. This is difficult, I don't know much about my new brother, what about? Stop. Austria covered her mouth. Lyra look. Ginny pointed at the old man in the painting. He looks more, angry now. Ginny noticed. I don't think we should be guessing the answer anymore. I have the feeling that something bad could happen. Astoria nodded. Bad. You are right. Lyra realized it now. And I don't think the password was set by Harry anyway, this place looks super old. He was probably just given the password by Dad. But what could it be then? Family words. 
Austria pointed at the painting. The blazon of the potters was engraved at the top. A blue hippogriff over a silver field. And the old man was wearing the same colors on his tunic. Indicating that this man was indeed an old member of the Potter family. The family words. Lyra did her best to recall. She knew her father had mentioned them at least once or twice during their lessons. Then, they came to her. Honor thy blood. Correct. The old man smiled at her and the painting opened up, revealing a set of descending stairs. Chapter 72, Unexpected Bystanders Wow, it worked. Lyra stared at the stairs in disbelief. The noises they were hearing before got a lot louder after the painting opened. It sounded like rocks and metal being hit. What is my brother doing down there? Lyra wanted to know more than ever. Astoria glanced at her while pointing at the stairs like saying do we go? Yes, but let's move slowly, try not to make any noise, Lyra whispered. MMM, I don't have a good feeling about this. Ginny didn't like this situation but still followed behind Astoria. The trio descended the set of stairs with care until they saw a small arch of stone at the end of it. This one led into another room. The one where all the noise was coming from. They all hid behind the entrance and peeked inside. A stone golem passed by them, and the construct was moving quickly while wielding a metal sword. Lyra and Ginny had to cover their mouth in order to avoid screaming. It did not help the situation when they saw a second menacing-looking golem just a short distance away or when they realized that the target of their blades was no other than Harry himself. Lyra stared in complete shock as her brother ducked one attack and moved away from another one. The room was not big enough to allow him much space away from the two golems and their sharp swords. Harry was just wearing some shorts and a simple t-shirt for easy movement. With only his spare wand as a means of defense. He is doing magic out of school. She whispered, not very sure why her first thought was about her brother breaking Hogwarts rules and being expelled. Instead of something like why are two magical creatures trying to kill my brother inside a hidden basement that I didn't even know existed until today. Gladius. Spoke Harry. With no more room to dodge, he had no other choice but to start fighting back. The transfiguration he just used had transformed his wand into a short double-edged sword. He deflected the incoming attack before answering by stabbing his blade through the head of the golem, leaving a big hole in it. The damage started to be repaired almost immediately but in the meantime, the magical construct was unable to move. He took this chance to push it back and create just enough space to escape from the corner where he had been stuck. As soon as he got past the first golem, the second one jumped into action. A swift vertical slash was about to hit his head and likely split it in two. Protego. A translucent shield appeared above his head, stopping the blade and preventing it from traveling further. Harry took a few steps back and lifted his own blade in the air. This one gained a white glow to it as magic was being channeled through it. Diffindo. Harry chanted the spell at the same time he completed a perfect vertical slash aimed at the second golem. Even though he was some distance away from it, a white surge of light came out of the sword and impacted the golem, splitting it vertically in half with a clean cut. Where did your brother learn to fight like that? Ginny whispered to Lyra. I have no idea he could fight with a sword, or with anything. For Lyra, the situation felt too surreal at the moment. Harry observed the golem he just cut. It seemed to be having trouble regenerating that one. It must be running low on magic by now he concluded. The other one had already recovered and rushed at him without hesitation. Harry lifted his blade and pointed at the golem. Incarceras. Ethereal ropes came out of the sword and tired themselves around the golem. Despite being in its current shape, the transfiguration that Harry had used on his wand, allows it to retain its core and one is able to still use it to cast magic. This combination of magic and swordmanship was something originally created by none other than Godric Greyfinder and later on perfected by one of his best friends and the one who taught him this style, Neville Longbottom. The golem only needed a couple of seconds to break free but it gave Harry some time to recover his breath. The sword shone again but it now gained a purple color and a baleful aura. The golem arrived at his side and lunged at him. Harry moved behind it and readied his blade. Divulsa. A purple wave of magic cut this golem in half this time horizontally, leaving behind a purple substance that started to corrode the golem. After it passed through the stone body of the construct, Harry's magic continued until it hit the wall next to the entrance. He then heard the scream of two girls. What was that? Lyra shouted. Lyra, what are you guys doing here? Harry exclaimed. He was too focused on his training and didn't notice the three girls entering the room. He hurried to remove the magic from the wall before it consumed it. 
or any of the girls if they got too close to the corrosive magic. Harry, behind you. Lyra was the first one to react. She screamed while pointing. Harry noticed the movement and reacted by moving quickly as a blade came lunging his way. This one still managed to stab his left shoulder. It seemed like the second Gollan, the one he had cut first, still had a bit of magic left. But it stopped moving right after getting a hit on him and promptly collapsed. No! Screamed Ginny. Despite having been cut in half and corroded. The other golem still had part of its upper torso and arms, so it continued to move and attack the closest target it detected. During its creation, Harry's orders have been very simple. Just kill whatever is in front of you. He wasn't expecting visits. Finite incantatum. He hurried to dispel the remaining magic on the golem and this one went back to being pieces of rock. Ugh. He groaned and up a hand to cover the wound on his shoulder to stop the bleeding. Harry, you are hurt. Lyra forgot about her million questions when she saw him bleeding and ran to him. Chapter 73, Questions Harry Lyra passed by the piles of rubble and knelt down next to her brother. Should we go call Miss Potter, Dot? Ginny had a concerned look on her face. And Astoria, just stared at him. He was going to take that as concern. No, there is no need to call her for this, Harry told them. But Harry, you are bleeding a lot. Lyra stared at his white shirt. The area around his shoulder was completely red. She is not wrong about the blood loss, that golem must have hit an artery. Is just a superficial wound, nothing serious, so calm down. He told her before calling for his elf. Dobby. The elf appeared next to him, looked over, and became horrified. Master Harry sir is hurt, oh no, this is Dobby's fault. No is not your fault so don't go now to hit your head on the wall or something. I need you to do me a favor. Go to our potions cabinet and bring me a Wigan Weld potion and a blood replenishing one, can you do that? The elf noted repeatedly. Then go. The girls stood in silence, looking at him for a good thirty seconds until Dobby came back with the potions. Harry took the vials and placed them in front of him while sitting cross-legged and removed his bloody shirt. The girl stared in shock as he took the first potion and poured its yellow liquid over the wound. They flinched when they heard a fizzing sound and smoke came out of Harry's shoulder. The process looked very painful but Harry didn't complain. He then took the other potion. The contents looked very much like human blood. It was thick and had a dark red color. Harry drank the whole bottle in one go. Afterward, the wound was completely closed and his face had recovered its normal color. Is it healed? Asked Lyra. Yes. I'm fine now. Good, then, can you tell me, what in Merlin's beard was all of this about? Lyra's stern face reminded him of his mother for a moment. He ignored her for now and pointed his wand at his stained shirt. Evanesco. The blood and dirt disappeared from the fabric, leaving it completely pristine. He then did the same with his shoulder, cleaning the blood stains from his skin, and put his shirt back on. Where did you learn that from? Asked Lyra. Reparo. With another wave of his spare wand, the golem's remains returned to their original places, repairing the walls in the process. Stop ignoring me. His sister hissed. Fine. Harry cleared the dust from his clothes and glanced at his sister. His expression became grave. But first, I need you to answer something for me. Why did you come here? He did not have to ask how she knew he was here already. His parents would not have told her and the only other who knew was Dobby. The elf reminded him of good old Hagrid, very loyal but damn awful at keeping secrets. I just wanted to know what you were up to, you have been sneaking around all week, Lyra told him. I didn't know she was paying so much attention to what I was doing. That was a mistake on my part. I see he now had a problem with no easy solution. Even if he were to obliviate her most recent memories, it would not remove the underlying issue. She didn't accidentally come across this room. She had been wanting to find it. This means that even if he erased her most recent memories, she would just keep trying to figure out what he has been doing. Then there are the other two girls. There should be no problem with Ginny, but Astoria is already a victim of a potent curse. He had no idea how she could react to being subject to the charm. As much as he preferred if they had never come here. Protecting his secrets is not worth the risk of hurting these girls. He sighed. In reality, there wasn't much of a choice to begin with. Can you three promise me that you can keep this a secret? You haven't told us anything yet. Lyra reminded him. 
and I won't tell you much more. Just promise me you will not talk about what you saw here to anyone. Does mom and dad know about this? Lyra asked. Yes. Harry nodded. Then, I have no one else to tell in any case. Lyra shrugged. Other than their uncle Remus and Holly, everyone she ever talked with regularly, already knew. I can promise you that I won't tell anyone. I'm very good at keeping secrets. Ginny said. Contract, Astoria reminded him. The binding contract her father had signed would affect the entire family and prevent them from divulging damaging secrets they learned about the Potters. Of course, it also worked the other way around. Harry wasn't sure how much Astoria was told about the contract. But that part was only referring to life or dead types of secrets, like revealing the location of their manor to Voldemort and his Death Eaters and that kind of stuff. His doing magic during the summer is not something that would have that much importance, as far as the contract was concerned. But the girl seemed convinced otherwise and he would not be correcting her since it was convenient for him. Okay, we promise not to tell anyone, now, can you at least answer a few questions? Lyra got closer to him. You can ask, but I can't promise I will answer. Lyra frowned. What were you doing here? Training. He told her the truth. Where did those monsters come from? Lyra wanted to point at their remains but they were completely gone. I made them. Transfigurational construction is a branch of magic that you will learn during your n.e.w.t.s years. If go that far in transfiguration. n.e.w.t. You can use magic for the sixth year already. Lyra was shocked. In reality, the golems he can make are far beyond the level of Hogwarts students, but at the very least, the basics can be learned in school. I would love to learn that, Dot. Ginny said with admiration. Where did you learn that magic? Did Dad give private lessons? Lyra asked. She remembers hearing that their father was quite exceptional at transfiguration at school. There was no answer from Harry. He rather keeps silent than lie to her. Are you really my brother? She seemed a bit hesitant to ask. He brother now was so different than the one she knew that it was becoming really hard to believe they were once the same person. Harry glanced at her. To enter here, you had to say our house words. He stated and she confirmed it. Do you know what they mean? To honor your blood? I guess it refers to one's family, isn't it? Lyra wasn't completely sure but that sounded about right. He placed both hands on her shoulders. It means that your family is the most important thing. Not just the present one but also the past. To honor, respect, and care for one's family. Lyra, I am your family, never doubt that. Ah, okay. Lyra stood baffled. Why can't my brothers speak like that? Ginny wondered out loud. Chapter 74, End of the Fun Weekend Let us get out of here. I'll escort you three back to the manor proper. Harry started to walk towards the stairs and the three girls followed him. None of them wanted to stay here any longer. As they were passing through the painting, Lyra decided to ask. Harry, who is the old geezer in the painting? Harry turned around and waited until they had all passed to close the entrance. What if I told you that you just insulted the founder of our house? Lyra gasped. Oh no, really? Is he the founder? Harry shrugged. I don't know. But he is definitely an old ancestor, so be more respectful. Oh, right, sorry. Lyra felt like she had been scolded by her parents. That painting is different than the ones at Hogwarts, right? My brothers told me the ones at the castle are very smart and you can even have conversations with them if you want to. Ginny commented. The ones at Hogwarts are living paintings. Those ones have been infused with the memories of the persons they once were, so they can talk and behave in a similar manner. He points at the painting. The old man inside had remained completely immobile the whole time. That is just a normal painting that someone enchanted to perform a specific task. Is also part of the security system they put in here. Security system, so, something bad would have happened if I didn't guess the correct password. Lyra asked with concern. Oh, yes. You lot were very lucky there. Too many mistakes and you would have activated the ward defenses. Harry delivered the words with a very grave tone. The girls opened their eyes widely. Even Astoria looked a bit scared. W what would have happened to us? Lyra asked with hesitation. Something very bad, I won't go into gruesome details thought. Said Harry. Merlin. Exclaimed Ginny. 
Make sure you don't do something like that again. Old magical protections can be very dangerous. The three girls quickly nodded. In truth, he had no idea what would have happened if were unable to guess the correct answer. Probably nothing serious, since Lyra is part of the family. But he decided that it was better to scare them a bit now, lest they try to do something like this again in a more dangerous setting. Magical wards from ancient magical dwellings are not something one wants to threaten carelessly. The use of dark curses to punish intruders was a common occurrence before the ministry started to regulate their use until they were ultimately banned. Harry navigated the maze-like basement with no issues, as he had come here every day since he was given permission by his father. As they approached the exit of the basement, the girls became more relaxed and broke their silence. Say Harry, you think I can practice magic here too? Maybe in a different room though. Lyra decided to ask. Harry gave her a glance. And what magic would you practice? You don't even have a wand yet. She made a pouting face that denoted her age. I'll get a wand very soon. A wand you don't know how to use yet. She was about to rebuke his comment when he interrupted her. What about this, wait until next summer, when you had at least your first year of school, and then we can go talk with Dad about you doing magic here. Lyra considered his suggestion for a moment. Okay, I think I can wait for a bit. Lyra, can I come too next summer? I don't think my parents would let me do much at home, other than chores. Said Ginny. Sure. Lyra grinned. Coming. Astoria also invited herself. Here we are. Harry opened the wooden door that led to the ground floor. Enjoy the rest of your morning, ladies. Lyra hit his shoulder in a playful manner. It doesn't suit you to talk like that. She then turned to look at her friends. Let's go to my room, we can play some games before lunch. Lyra and Astoria started to walk away but Ginny stayed behind and stared at him. Is something wrong? Harry wondered what she wanted to tell him. When Dad is working and Mom is too busy in the house, I sometimes sneak into the shred and borrow one of my brother's brooms to fly around, my mom would kill me if she ever found out, she doesn't want me to fly, says is too dangerous. I have only told Charlie and Bill. She said in a whisper so the other girls didn't hear. Harry was about to ask her why did she told him that, but then he realized. In her own way, she wanted to give him some reassurance. I understand, I'll make sure to keep your secret safe then. She smiled. And I'll keep yours. Ginny said before turning around and running to catch up with Lyra and Astoria. The rest of the day passed peacefully and by late afternoon, Molly came to bring Ginny back home. Harry was glad that he was able to patch things up with her and that she enjoyed her visit this time at least. An hour later, Lady Greengrass appeared out of the fireplace and took Astoria away. It was hard to tell if Astoria had a fun weekend since her face barely moved but Selene seemed to think so. Harry wondered how his sister and her became friends. Maybe Astoria could express herself much better in the letters they exchange. Or maybe it was just a matter of lack of options since Lyra cannot leave the house too often, just for some shopping with their mother or for some party at the ministry. But in any case, now that it was over, he could take it easy until the next weekend, when they were visiting the family vault. Chapter 75, The Deeps Key, please. The goblin requested. Here it is. James handed him a golden key with intricate decorations carved into it, and the letter P placed at the top. The goblin examined the key until he seemed satisfied it was authentic. Follow me, Lord Potter, and, family. The goblin started to walk away and they had to hurry their steps to keep up with him. He eventually led them into a massive chamber with any mine carts stationed in it. It was a room that Harry remembered well from his first visit with Hagrid. It feels like it was an eternity ago, I was such a naive child back then. So much has happened since. Harry thought. The goblin climbed inside one of the carts and waited for the potters to sit. Get yourself comfortable, Harry. It's going to be a long trip his mother advised him. Really. He had already figured that his family vault would be located deeper than the trust vault he was familiar with. From what he recalled from the structure of the Gringotts underground vault system, the oldest the vault, the deeper it is located. How far are we talking about? James had a mischievous grin on his face. You'll have to wait and see. Harry wanted to roll his eyes. His father can sometimes behave in childish ways. After several minutes of minecart riding, they arrived at an area of Gringot vaults that he remembered well but not in a good way. This area contained the vaults of very old wizard families and was under the protection of dragons. 
he even spotted the pale dragon they had used to make their escape from here, after stealing from the Lestrange vault. Let's hope I never have to do something like that again, he thought. Harry was expecting the car to slow down and stop somewhere around here. But instead, this one continued to go deeper. There's more. He asked with genuine surprise. He was sure that this was as deep as it went. We are getting close now. Said Lily. I used to hate this next part as a kid, always got sick, James recalled. Now, hold on to something. The goblin started to say after the cart stopped. Harry noticed that they had reached the end of the end of the rail, but he could not see any vaults around here. Just empty rocky walls and darkness. Ahead of them was a massive gap that seemed to go on forever as it was impossible to see what lay further in. Where is the vault? Harry decided to ask. We are going down. The goblin in front of him huffed before pulling down a lever. Down, hold it there are no more rails. He. Shouted. Harry considered for a moment if this creature was trying to get them killed but then he noticed his father grinning. The car tipped forward and then, they started to descend in a completely vertical angle. Turns out, he was wrong. The rails were not over, they still continued on the walls of this massive hole. This only lasted for a short but very intense seconds. And then he could finally see the bottom of the hole. After taking a turn at an impossible angle, they now found themselves in a very simple circular rocky chamber barely illuminated by a few torches here and there. All around them were metallic doors with symbols on top of them. The cart continued to move until it reached the center of the chamber and then it stopped. This was now the true end of the rail, there was nowhere else to go from here. We have arrived. Said the goblin, despite the redundancy of the statement. That part is always so scary. Lily had her eyes closed the entire time. James chuckled and patted his back. What did you think of that, son? Was it fun, Dot? He chuckled. Harry placed his hand over his father's arm. Ouch. James made a jump. What happened? Lily was startled by the sudden shout. I just gave him a mild electrical shock, Harry answered. That was not mild at all. James cried. Wait, you did that without a wand? That's impressive. You can do wandless magic, Harry. Lily asked. She did not know much about what Harry could do when it came to magical skills. He had only talked about the most important events he went through during his past life. Just a few minor things. Harry shrugged. He couldn't do much with a complete lack of magical foci, but at least he wasn't completely defenseless. Still, he always likes to make sure he has some spare weapons at hand. Wizard, no magic here. The goblin looked to be extremely upset despite how little the display of magic was. Oh. I forgot to warn you. The security here is very strict. If you do any magic near any of the doors, it could trigger the goblin's defense. Said James. Isn't this big hole enough defense? Who is going to come down here? Harry wondered. If you can recognize the owners of these vaults, I bet a lot of people would want to get inside them James answered while pointing to a specific door. To this, Harry got closer to the doors so he could inspect the symbol on top. It was a golden griffin over a crimson field. What? This is Gryffindor Vault? Wait a minute. Harry moved to the vault next to that one. A golden eagle over a blue field. Ravenclaw. The next one was a grey badger over a black and yellow field. Hufflepuff. And the next one, as he expected was the black snake over a field of green. Slytherin, why are the vaults of the four Hogwarts founders here? Is not just them. This chamber contains the vaults of the eleven families that formed the Council of Wizards said James. And our family is also here, of course. Said Lily. Quite amazing, hey. James chuckled. An. Remember to comment, vote, and slash or leave a review if you have the time. Those things help me a lot and I would really appreciate it. You can support me on Patreon if you like and get 10 advanced chapters. Dash P A T R E O N dot com slash K R I O G N X. Thanks for listening. <laughs>